the Lord. How's everybody doing? Give a shout out. Where are you from? All right, good dear. We got Texas, all over Texas, <clears throat> Washington. Um, I think I saw Virginia, the Hill Country, Detroit, Kentucky, Canada, New Hampshire. Oh, Portugal, all right. Wales, oh. <clears throat> knew a great guy uh, from Wales. The language is dying over there, the Welsh language. Excellent, excellent. Well, wow, I am excited. Welcome, hello. Look, I'm Nicholas Bergner. If you have zero training or zero experience in any of this stuff, right? If you've never put a seed in the ground, if you even think you have a black thumb, like I want to encourage you and ensure you that you can do this. It's not hard. None of this stuff is difficult. Matter of fact, get your brain out of the way. The seed was designed to grow. It wants to grow, right? So we just gotta like retune our brains and retune ourselves to be able to help co-create life and add the habitat and the environment uh, for seeds to flourish, right? So we don't have to overthink any of this. So yes, no experience, you can do this. <clears throat> And by the end of this class, you'll actually feel very confident in doing it. So I'm going to show you how to build a garden bed, a preparedness garden bed, uh, because there's multiple aspects of looking at how to garden, but we're going to keep it very simple. Um, learn how to do this with, with, with very little input as well. So it won't be very expensive. And even if there isn't a, a time like now where there's a pandemic, and look, some people on here uh, have, have lost tons in their 401k or their stock market, right? And, and, you know, when this first started, food was just flying off the shelves. There wasn't any food there. So you don't have to fear any of that. You don't have to worry about it. You just have to have a little bit of patience with yourself and a little bit of skill and a little bit of know-how. And you're here today and I'm going to show you, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to guide you through how to do this stuff. So I'm the director of the School of Permaculture. Um, permaculture is a design system that works with nature and not against it. It helps you provide as much of your resources as possible, if that's food, water, um, energy systems, shelter, you know, shelter that heats and cools itself, doesn't need electricity, and community, right? And these are the things that are foundational for life. Um, even if there's no money, you're going to know how to need to, you're going to know, you're going to need to know how to grow food, how to cook food, basic living skills. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So um, this is extremely invaluable, extremely valuable information. And I want you to have fun today. Uh, it's great. The internet is zooming. So we're going to be planting a little bit later, but at the same time with that, do yourself a favor and take this training and this information seriously, right? So the way to do that is to minimize distractions. How do you minimize distractions? Well, if you got your cell phone, right, turn it over, turn it over. If you've got your, uh, turn it over and put it on silent. Obviously, if there's an emergency, you need to take care of that. If there's a, another web page that's up right now, right, minimize all that. And it's not just uh, to minimize distraction, but it's to help you. If you look at the studies on learning, right, the, the, the biggest hindrance is the distraction. So let's get focused in, let's get deep into the information that we're gonna uh, study today. And it's that deep study, even if it's simple, that's gonna help you retain the information and move forward. Uh, a little bit more on housekeeping. If you have any questions, uh, I will try to answer the questions as they come over through chat. But uh, there is a Q and A uh, session or section on the bottom of this Zoom um, uh, application, 
uh, or wherever it's at. There's, it says Q&A. So you can click that and you can add your question there. You can send it to just me. You can send it to the entire um, uh, audience that's here right now. Uh, so other people can see it. Maybe they won't. If you ask, ask something and somebody else has another, has the same question, they won't ask it as well or vice versa. I may unmute you to answer that question at the very end. Probably not, but it's something that you want to think about. Uh, I usually read the question at the end. Um, put you, I say your name and I read the question. You could also put at the end of the question, hey, please don't unmute me. You could have uh, seven kids running around and I wouldn't be surprised if my three-year-old came in here in a minute and you'll all meet faithful and it'd be great. Um, so there's an opportunity here at the end. So ask as many questions as you like and I'll do my best to answer them. And also tell you, I don't know if I don't know um, and we will find out together. So the focus of today, we're gonna be focusing on two big things, uh, two big things. One is how to create and prepare a preparedness garden and how to sustain it, right, in perpetuity if possible. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here, but we're gonna keep it very simple and very inexpensive. Um, and then the other thing we're gonna talk about, the other main category is what food to grow right now and why. Um, I got lots of questions on what region is this going to cover? So this will cover globally, but there are some like little bits of information that you know. I'm going to mention some crops that, and I'll, when we go over them, uh, I'll, I'll tell you their issues, um, that won't work well in the tropics, but they're substitutes, and I'll tell you those substitutes, uh, and vice versa. There's some of this tropical food that won't do well here in the temperate climate. Also, one thing we're not going to be focused on today, it's basically half the world's the southern hemisphere, because uh, most of the plants that I'm going to be talking about right now is stuff you can work with right now in the spring as we're coming out of winter. Unfortunately, that leaves our, <clears throat> our compatriots and our comrades there in Australia and South America kind of um, in the dark, at least with this information. But don't worry, this information is still applicable when it turns around for uh, uh, spring for them. And I might do a fall series for this because you're going to need to know how to do this in the fall as well. So there's some things to think about right here. So um, I've been doing this this uh, over the last week, this webinar series, and I've got a lot of folks saying like it's a victory garden and I, I love victory gardens. I love them, but this is not a victory garden. Um, <clears throat> let, let me tell you why I love victory gardens first in the first world war and especially in the Second World War, they got pushed because the factories couldn't keep up with food production or the farms. So the simple solution is basically what we're, say, we're talking about here, grow your food at home. It put a massive burden, it lifted a massive burden off of the systems of creating food. Uh, it was fantastic, it worked really well. Most of that interest dwindled immediately when both of those wars ended. And there were still food shortages after that because it, the systems weren't back in play. <clears throat> so that part of the victory gardens I love. However, if you plant a victory garden, how it's being promoted today, because there's a new interest in it, or how it was being, or how it was created uh, back in the early turn of the 20th century, you're going to either be um, plagued by pests or engulfed with chemicals like pesticides, probably both. And that's just not something that we want to really focus on. And there's much better ways to do it where we can sustain our growing systems by mimicking with nature. And nature doesn't use chemicals. So that's something to think about there. Um, you know, we want some healthy food. And by spraying herbicides, pesticides, and even artificial fertilizers and fungicides, uh, it's not going to be good for your body. And right now, we need an immune boost, uh, not an immune killer, immunity killer. So I have some better alternatives at the end of the of these sessions. I will go over those. So, um, you know, <clears throat> the supermarket wasn't even really in its form that it is today. It didn't even really exist until about 1916, some sources say. And it wasn't even until the 1930s that it kind of took off. Um, and so the question is, is asked then, well, what did people do for their food prior to that? They grew their food. Every family did, right? So it's in your genes. It's in your DNA to grow food. 
Um, now, the good thing about permaculture, like what we teach at the School of Permaculture and we teach worldwide, is that we have design now to growing foods to make the extra hard work lessen so you don't have to work so hard. But look, if our ancestors did it, you can do it, right? And, and you can do it with confidence and not be too afraid of making mistakes. Matter of fact, I want you to make mistakes, especially in a garden. You're going to make mistakes. Learn through that, right? There's really no such thing as a mistake. It's just a learning opportunity. Look, <clears throat> I have trained in person, at least cert certified like hun hundreds of students um, and just training, uh, just, just classes, most likely in the thousands of persons and in multiple countries. And, and our little YouTube channel it has like over 1.5 million views, which goes to show you the interest in permaculture and sustainable living and homesteading. Uh, some of the most heartwarming stuff that I have is when students come up to me later and they're like, hey, I took the class and one of them was like, you saved us $160,000 on our, you know, 20 acre landscape of you know what we're going to put in is infrastructure. I'm so glad you said slow down, take the class and the permaculture design course and wait. So that's been very rewarding. Or they show me pictures or videos they send to me that says this is what I've been doing, and it's just it's great. I mean, I, as an educator, I love those moments. Um, <clears throat> uh, growing with an ecosystem is great. So many of the students that I that I train and me myself have had zero training in need of this. I didn't come from a farmer's background. Matter of fact, uh, since I was old enough, um, I, I, I went into um, you know, small business for myself and, I've owned the, and, the, and I own the same business since 2002. And we have this nonprofit called the School of Permaculture. But I wanna tell you, like, I purposely got tired of that as many people do and it just made more sense not to rely upon the economic systems and put my focus on things that are important, right? Like food, water, shelter, energy, uh, creating a time-rich environment, regardless of what the economy or the market is doing. And as you know, right now, the economy and the market is extremely volatile and fluctuating. There's businesses closing left and right, people getting laid off left and right. There's some panic in the world. Um, you know, uh, this creates a time-rich environment, so you can actually take your time and doing it right, and when it's mature, you can potentially choose not to go to a place of employment unless you want to, and that's a really good thing. So this is my passion and my calling, and um, I really just am called, and I try my best to love people, uh, failing uh, every day at it. Uh, and I want to help you. And so those are the two big goals of me and the two big goals of the School of Permaculture. And this is something truly important, not only for these times, because this will eventually pass. We won't know what the new normal is. And when that happens, there's going to be a big focus on the preparedness again, right? Not, not in a fear-based way, but what can you do to not be so dependent upon these systems that are failing and potentially are going to continue to fail. So with that, um, let's begin. You guys ready? <clears throat> All right, so when we get into these two big topics that we're going to get into, it's probably very good to right here at the very beginning, let's, let's create an understanding of what it means to grow food. Uh, there's two big areas of focus when it comes to growing food. And one of them is growing food to make money, like you know, most farmers do, most market gardeners do. Um, there's a very good um, permaculture-centric gardener in, in Canada. His name is Jean Martin Fortier. He wrote the Market Gardener book. He shows you how to make um, good money being a very small operation uh, in, the, in the six figures. One of the things that stood out to me in those books was, uh, or that book, <clears throat> was um, 400 foot rows of greenhouse tomatoes yields him 36,000 Canadian dollars a year. Uh, the next big, uh, easy, best crop to grow uh, as far as money is concerned is going to be lettuce. So those two crops are great if you want to make money, but 
here's the interesting thing. If money won't allow you to buy food because there's not food to buy, what is money actually worth? I don't know, there is a toilet paper shortage. Uh, maybe that can be something we can use money for later, at least the paper currency. It only has value because we believe it has value. Or something like a seed has real value because it's useful and of a daily need for people. And don't mistake me, understand my, my background and where I come from. I understand that money makes things easier and I'm all for it. Go invest in the stock market if that's your thing, do all that. I'm not against it. I'm just saying for times like these, let's think about some serious focus. Now, the other form, other than, than, uh, than growing for money or market or, or, or something like that, is homesteading or kitchen gardening, homesteading gardening. In other words, growing food for you and your family, right? So you can provide and protect, you know, boost the immune system as well. And that's really where we're going to spend our time and focus right now. So understand there is overlap of the two systems. There is, um, but we want to focus on what we can do for our family. So uh, let's look at the criteria for the crops that I have uh, picked out today. So today, we purposely, I purposely chose things that you can start right away and also um, that make sense for right now. So one of the, the top criteria here is food that stores long term. Another criteria is that it has to be easy to grow. can sow seed, and that's just a fancy term for putting the seed in the ground, um, can sow seed in ground without a nursery. And what that means is like, um, you didn't have to put it in a greenhouse or a work area for the, for, the, for the little baby plant to start growing and it needed a specific environment. Uh, we can just go right in the ground eliminating some of the, the, the pre-work. Now, there's nothing wrong with nursery work. Matter of fact, it's great. Um, we're a little bit past that, that time in the winter right now to really capitalize on it for things like onions and, and whatnot. But, <clears throat> but right now, we don't have to. We don't have to do that. You have zero experience, potentially. Let's do easy stuff that will create lots of food that you can you know, store. It's easy. You can put it right in the ground, right? You can start with zero experience. You don't have to know anything. And then it's easy to grow and maintain. This should give you a lot of encouragement, right? This, this makes it really simple. We're going to focus on food that can meet this criteria. I'm going to go ahead and give you a list of crops that we're going to focus on today. And if you want, you can just take this list and, and move forward with it. This is my daughter's favorite color here. So beans. And these are just going to be in alphabetical order. Corn garlic. And there's an asterisk there. We'll talk about that later. Potato. Sweet potato. And wheat. And then I have some others um, that I'm going to mention in, in multiple other categories here once we go through these. So that's the le list that we're going to grow 
you know what it is now. You could just put some stuff in the ground, but I, I need to go over some things on each one of these for you. And I'm gonna do that after we get into uh, preparing your garden bed and, and, and some, some type of sustainable fertilization, right? So we're gonna kind of take these and put them over here. We're gonna move them um, to the side, focus on some other stuff and then come back to these and then talk about these others as well. Now I've been to um, I've been to a number of places on the globe, and I've definitely been to ever, the, the three major climate regions um, in the world, which is tropics, temperate climate, and the dry lands. And I've seen garden systems in all of those. And there are more productive gardening systems that we can do that yield more food than what I'm going to talk about right now. But they also take more inputs. So when we look at input, meaning what you have to either work, buy, or do, create, input to output, I don't know a better gardening method that also works with nature than sheet mulching. This is also known as <clears throat> lasagna gardening and um, the Ruth Stout method. And you know, some of the things that's popular is like the Back to Eden method, which is kind of its own thing. Uh, it's very similar, but, but there, uh, there's some things you need to know about that. So, so we're gonna talk about a sheet mulch garden bed. It's something that anybody can do. And I'm gonna talk to you about it in two ways, okay? The first way um, is going to be a, a way that um, I, it's a very successful method to grow this. And I tell you that because, you know, I get hired from time to time to do consulting design and sometimes install. And I've got tired of failing, um, you know, putting in gardens and then a couple of years later, they, they were overgrown with, with like grasses. And so I created a, a very successful way to do this. Now it takes more time and you need, you know, you have to gather material to do it. You can purchase it. And I'm going to go over that way first, and then at the end, I'm going to show you an extremely quick and fast way to do the same thing. Now, it won't be as good, but it will be good, and it will be good for right now to put food in, and over the course of this next year, you can go back to that first method, right? So, so I'm going to show you like you know, two ways to do it, right? So the first way is we have some ground. Here we are. And let's just say it has grass on it. Now, where I am at in the world, this grass is full of, um, well, we got lots of Bermuda grass, which was introduced into to the United States. We think it came from um, bedding for slaves and, and slave ships in Africa. We're not 100% sure, but it goes to show you, if you want to keep a lawn, you're pretty much promoting slavery. So <laughs> go ahead and stop using a lawn as fast as possible and make it productive. So we have this lawn here or whatever it is that has some grasses. So what I'm going to recommend is that you just completely get rid of those grasses and further than what your garden's going to be. So if your garden's say here and here, you want to get rid of the grasses, you know, a good way, a good way, a good ways out. <clears throat> now, once you've got rid of the grasses, there's a couple of ways to do it. One is just uh, use poultry netting and put chickens in for an extended period of time. They'll completely scratch over all of the grasses that are there. Uh, put more than you need in that little area or whatever area it is. You can use the trifecta of destruction, um, which is chickens, pigs, and goats. You can even add sheep in there and they'll just absolutely destroy everything in a quick amount of time. Now you wanna do that um, if you have time, right? <clears throat> or if you have the, if you're on a farm and you have those animals to work with. If you don't, and you're in the suburbs or you're gorilla gardening somewhere, you may want to bring in some machinery. And so you can bring in a, uh, a sod cutter, right? Which you go in and, and it's a little machine that helps you cr uh, pull the sod off. You can rent a skid steer or know somebody with a bulldozer or a track hoe or something like that. We want to get rid of those grasses, move them to the side. Now, if you're in an area where you don't have aggressive grasses and you don't have to worry about it, you can sheet mulch right over these. But, you know, I've had 
I've had full on community gardens fail because they didn't listen to this, uh, these teachings, uh, multiple uh, uh, gardens fail. And so I, I do re highly recommend take out the grasses. All right, so you take them out and then till, right? So the first thing here, let's go over the steps. All right, one. One. Let's take out grasses. Two, till. Yes, this is a no-till method, but while we're creating it, it's a one-time operation. And the reason you till is because <clears throat> those aggressive grasses are very aggressive. Now the chickens and even your bulldozer or whatever got most of the stuff out, most of the roots, the rhizomes, but there's life energy in there. And so if you got long ones, they're just gonna pop right through. And really I've seen Bermuda just eat through two layers of cardboard, like it was no big deal. So what the tilling does is it takes those long strands and then it breaks them into tiny pieces and it doesn't have enough life energy to pop through our finished product. Now, <clears throat> normally you would not till because of that reason. So this is a timed event. All these steps should take place within like, you know, five to seven days max, right? All of these steps are gonna ride out. So that's something to think about too. You don't till it and then wait you know, a month and then do this because it will you had time to uh, had time to regrow and really set. You turned a million roots into a hundred million roots. So till it one time. Um, <clears throat> then anything that's in your refrigerator or um, that's that's not toxic, obviously, all your old condiments that are going out, your kitchen scraps, right? Just throw those down. Those are like a, a boost. So I'm just going to put kitchen scraps and just pop them there. And just throw them down. And what that is, is that's an inoculator for boosting uh, microbial life and some earthworm life. All right, on top of that, we want to cover this. Now, there are some issues with cardboard, but I'm going to go ahead and use it. You can use newspaper too. Uh, but with cardboard, you can put that down and layer it six inches apart. So you also want to pay attention to, like, let's just say this slope was doing that. <clears throat> so start here at the bottom, put your cardboard down. And then your next bit of cardboard, you're going to uh, overlap it at least six inches, right? Let's see. You got that? That's at least six inches. And you're going to continue to do this the whole way up. And the reason that you start at the bottom, because you're, we're shingling it like your roof shingles, and you need to wet down every layer, right? So wet down, you know, water it, every layer. <clears throat> and the reason that you're doing it like this is because while you're building this, maybe it takes a week and it starts raining. If you would have done this the opposite way, then when rain hit, it, it wouldn't shingle off. It wouldn't roll downhill. It would actually peel the cardboard up. Right, so you might not do this all at one time. If you're literally doing this all within a five hour gap because you got a big team or whatever, uh, it doesn't really matter. But you know, for most people, it takes a couple of, of days to, to, to do all this for a larger garden. For one garden bed, it's not a big deal. So you wanna layer it like that. And if you can, two layers, right? So do the same thing over again and make sure you have zero gaps. If you have gaps, the grasses will run through um, and I've seen it happen time and time again. All right, so on top of the cardboard, we're gonna have a, um, we're gonna have <clears throat> our first big nitrogen layer. So here, if you're on a farm, we can use raw manure of a cow. If you don't have raw manure of a cow, composted cow manure, is going to be great, or just you know just composted manure. It doesn't even matter, or just compost if that's all you can get, right here. And that compost will be this pink. So it's manure compost. This is going to be three to six inches high, three to six inches high. And then on top of that, 
if you can, we want a heavy carbon material. So if you can get a straw, like a wheat or an oat straw, not sprayed. Right? And that's sometimes a challenge to do. Right? But if you can find it, that's ideal here. And you're going to put that up on top of this. And you'll notice that when you put it up, it's going to go over that first layer. Every layer is going to gently go over the next layer, right? So it won't be like a straight up and down thing unless you have a border on it, then it will be. So this is straw and that's also three to six inches. On top of that, we're going to put another three to six inches, but this time it's just compost. Where this first layer here, you had options. You can put raw manure because most of your plants won't even get down here the first year. So this is a time release capsule. This will continue to compost over the next year or two and then boom, you've got another season or maybe two seasons of nutrient and life down here at the very bottom. So but this one, the plants roots will get into this one. So it's just compost right there. So that's seven, we have a layer of compost. And that is also three to six inches. And then our last layer is another layer of straw. But this time it is eight to 12 inches. All right, so what you're seeing here is a 17 inch or bigger raised garden bed. Right? And if you're in the desert or if you're in the, the, <clears throat> the dry lands, you do the same thing, but you just sink it down into the ground, right? So this would be grayed here, and then your, your pathways would be raised. Uh, that's because in the dry lands, you need to soak the water into the ground as much as possible. But both in the tropics and the temperate climate, uh, North America, um, Europe, and <clears throat> South America, Australia, those places, New Zealand, you want to uh, do this raised. So that's it. So this is great. This is your walking path here and this is raised up. Now it doesn't matter if you use circle beds or square beds or rectangle or anything. Uh, this will work. Once you want to plant this, there's two ways to plant. Say you did have four inch pots. You had four inch pots that you bought at a store or you raised them in nursery work before. What you do is you come in and you move the the, um, the straw here on the top aside with your, with your hand. You throw in a handful of compost, wet it down a little bit, and then put in your, your four inch pot like this with the baby plant on it. And then you, with your hand, um, you come and bring that straw up to the stem of the plant like that and then water, water it in, right? Maybe press it down a little bit. And that's a way to, to grow. And what'll happen is these roots will come down and find really healthy soil and it's aerated and it's great. So what we're, what we're technically doing is we're mimicking nature. So the question is who fertilizes a forest? Well, nobody, the forest was designed to sit and stand in its own detritus or its own slow compost pile over time, right? So it, like it makes a lot of leaves, those leaves fall to the ground, makes leaves, leaves fall to the ground. So it stands in its own decomposition and it fertilizes itself. It's not just the organic matter that's fertilizing, it's the life that's created in here. And it, it is about life, life and to have it more abundantly. And so we want to create and mimic the forest floor and grow our food like that so we don't have to work so hard through fertilization. All right, so like, oh, and one other thing here, if you want to put seeds in here, not all seeds will do well on straw. If you need, uh, like for example, tomatoes may or may not, right? Tomatoes actually are a hardy seed, but some seeds are not gonna respond well to straw. So you can just get some fine sifted compost and put it here at the top and then create a soil lens. And then you can put your seeds in that soil lens on, on the very top like that. So it's a very good way to build a garden bed and it's sheet molting. But it does take some time, it does take some work collecting these materials, but very high success rate, I give it two thumbs up. Let's talk about the other way 
And also let me do a little check in here, make sure everybody's good. This is still work. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there's no problems with the communication or the connectivity. Um, actually, just give me a shout out. If, if everything's still going good, you guys can see everything, you're up to date, just give me a heck yeah. All good. Okay, good deal. All right, so now let's talk about how to do this quickly, like, right? You don't have time. And matter of fact, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, right now is the time to do this, right? So <clears throat> I'm about to do some, some of these same classes and webinars for some local colleges. And, you know, they wanted to wait up until like, you know, more around Earth Day. And I'm saying, well, look, we really need to do it now. So, you know, pushing the time frame up. Now, all through spring, you're going to be able to plant uh, a lot of these crops. But right now is like definitely the time. So how do you do this very quickly? So one of the things you can do is instead of building up all the layers, I mean, you could even put it on the grass if you want. Just know that that grass will get overtaken by, uh, by Bermuda within one to two years, definitely within two years. But what you can do is just start bringing in purchased compost. Right? So here where I'm at in North Texas, we have a couple of places a cubic yard uh, goes for, I think, like $32, right? Something, something like that retail. Now, you need like 1.2 cubic yards to do, like, let's just say this is your garden bed. This is eight. This is four. Uh, and then we went, uh, like, like, here's the, the ground. But then you went up 12 inches, 12 inches high. So those dimensions there of just compost, is 1.2 cubic yards, right? 1.2 cubic yards, right? So one garden bed this thick is like 32 bucks ish, a little bit more for the 0.2, and you can just plop it on the ground and go, right? You don't have to think about it. Just plop it on the ground and go, but don't make it too thin. Don't try to do a four-inch bed, right? I mean, your radishes and stuff like that will do it, but go up at least 12 inches. Go 17 inches if you can, right? And you can just go, most truck beds will hold uh, two cubic yards of compost. So you can just go buy this right now and, and get to work. So, and, and to give you some reference on our farm, which we're transitioning to right now, I was gonna let this year's garden go because we are in transition, we're in a big construction phase, but I stopped doing that because food's obviously very important. You can't do any construction without food. So I, <clears throat> um, I went ahead and bought a bunch of compost and I'm laying it down right on the grasses. So I'm doing this method right now to, for expediency and to make sure that, that we have food, food growing. So that's a really good method. It can be done. It will be taken over by the grasses if you don't remove them. Okay, so one of the things if you do a victory garden is it's going to say, look, you're going to need to go buy fertilizer, this and that. I get it, right? You can get purchased stuff. I mean, there are some good purchased natural organic fertilizers like blood and bone meal, um, azomite, things like this, right? Um, green sand, like those are really good. And if you got them, great. But how do you do this with like zero or very little money, right? <clears throat> so it's going to be making your own fertilizer. Uh, and I'm going to show you two ways. Um, right here at the very top, I'm going to show you, well, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to show you a quick way to compost. So now this is going to be good too, because even if you are in a place in the world where you don't have the ability to go out and buy that compost or find all your sheet mulching material, which by the way, you can find sheet mulching material for free in the wild. Um, uh, you can do that. You can create your own compost a cubic yard at a time, right? So that's basically a garden bed at a time within 18 days. So this is the Berkeley method of composting, uh, which came through the University of Berkeley in the 70s. I would have loved to have been in that class. And <clears throat> it's also called the 18 day compost. Now this is a thermophilic or it's a hot compost. That means the microorganisms uh, that do the work are above you know, 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a very quick system. It gives you both colloidal 
pieces of compost as well as chunky pieces at the end. And you can just plant right into it. It won't be too hot. So let's talk about that uh, for just a second and, and talk about how we can make those. So if you're on a farm, okay, we'll, I'll make a little matrix here. You need two main ingredients. You need greens. You need greens and you need browns. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about what you what you cannot put in your compost. You can put pretty much in this in this version, only in this version, you can put everything in it. Meat, roadkill, dairy. The only reason they say not to really do that is because it attracts rodents. Well, you don't have to worry about that too much here. Those, those live things get eaten really quickly, like in four days. Um, but I would say the only thing not to put in here is carnivore poop, like your dog poop. And I've had a little bit of dog poop in mind. A couple of pieces is no big deal. But, you know, you don't want to put, you know, if, if you're running a, a, a puppy mill or a, a shelter for dogs or, and cats, you don't want to put all that in here. That needs to be digested maybe through a biodigester. But, and that'll create uh, nutrient rich one too. Maybe another lesson, another day on that. But other than that, it's free game. Like this is good stuff. So if you're on a farm, some of the easiest things to get is manure, right? Cow manure is great. Horse manure, rabbit manure, chicken manure. That's great. If you're not on a farm, or, or, let's do a hybrid. If you are or, or are not on a farm, your kitchen scraps, right? Your kitchen scraps are perfect. Everything, uh, when you're done cooking, that bacon grease, your potato, your sweet potato peelings, everything, all your peppers, everything like that. You just put it in there. Every day you can go out and do it. And I'll talk about a, a method here in a bit. Um, uh, if you are on a farm again, you know, blood from the culling of animals like chickens, you know, feathers are good here. And if you're not, you know, your kitchen scraps are going to be your main thing in the, uh, the urban and suburban area. And here's the thing on that though. So, well, let me do this and then I'll tell you about the urban suburban area, right? So now the browns, so straw, again, if you're on a farm, that's gonna be great. If you're not, you know, your neighbors do something amazing for you. They give you bagged leaves, right? And I love using oak leaves for this. So bagged leaves are great, right? So these are gonna be your two main sources and really, that's all you need. If you have manure and straw, you're good. If you have kitchen scraps and bag leaves, you're good, right? So you can even just focus on those right now without thinking about all the other stuff. Also, all the other stuff that you grow in your garden, you, know, you have at least two harvests from every plant, the thing that you eat and then the rest of the plant. So the rest of the plant, if you can t take it in, cut it into pieces and it can be a green or you can let it dry out, uh, oxidize or decompose and you can turn it into a brown. Right. So these are your, uh, there's a lot more here, but, you know, let's just focus with like, zero, you know, you have zero, not a lot of experience doing this. You could find manure and straw, you can find kitchen scraps and bag leaves. So let's take a little bit of a uh, focus on the suburbs or the urban environment. If you choose to do this, the kitchen scraps, um, there's pros and cons to it. Actually, it's all pros and one con, which only lasts a day and that's a bad smell. So I would recommend like a 35 gallon 35 gallon Rubbermaid tote with a lid um, made out of rubber, not a metal one and not, uh, not any other kind of plastic, a rubber one, 35 gallons. Now just every day after you're done cooking, all of your, your kitchen waste, organic waste, will just go into a little bucket in the kitchen and every day you come out, you lift the lid and you pour that in here. Now that will eventually go putrid and anaerobic. And that's normally not what you want, but it's fine for this. I've done a lot of these. And so every time you lift that up, it's a whole, you know, not, a, not the funnest smelling thing. It's like a sewage pit down in here. And that's why the, these Rubbermaids really, really excel and shine here. If you are concerned about uh, uh, some rodent pulling that up, just put a cinder block on the top. You'll be fine. All right, so, and then this is, you have enough green material in this when you're about three quarters the way full. Right. That's how you know you have enough or all the way full. 
And when it comes to the bagged leaves, um, the big box stores sell those big bags of leaves right, that, you, that you fill up and everybody puts them on the side of the road. All right, those bags of leaves, I don't know what the volume is on them, but I think you're, you're familiar with what I'm saying. You need <clears throat> about 12 to 15 of those bags full of leaves. And ideally it's clean, right? So, you, you know, uh, somebody who has a big oak tree or, or, or just any kind of tree um, that, that you're pulling up the leaves. If you know that and you see a bunch of plastic hanging out off the top, you don't want those. So this will, you know, give you a good amount. Manure and straw, you can find it on your, your farmstead if you have that. If you're in a suburban or urban environment, it's about saving your kitchen scraps until you have enough and then you're saving bags of leaves. And then once you have that, that, then it goes into the construction. And let's talk about the construction right now. <clears throat> so there's a couple of tools you'll need. Your biggest tool that you use is a hay fork. This is going to make easy work of a lot of this information for you. You're going to need a tarp and you're going to need water. Right, because the, the, the four ingredients that a compost pile actually needs is greens, browns, air, and water. And these are the big tools you're going to need, or the things that you're going to need to bring in. So it's pretty simple. Um, that makes life easier. You don't need it, but it does make life a lot easier. All right, so you want to just go to the ground. I've done lots of these. You can do fancy stuff, but look, just put it right on the ground, especially if we don't have time uh, right now. So right here on the ground, it doesn't matter what's there. Even if the grasses are there, it will actually kill the grasses in this little area that, that we're working with. So you want to get either the straw or the leaves. And you want to put a fat cap on the bottom, right? So this is pretty thick right here on the bottom. And just like on the sheet mulching, you're going to water every layer. Now here in North Texas, when you're first constructing this, if you're in a similar climate, you can't overwater this. You can just drench it in water. I've had a student come up to me with a great idea actually. Uh, his name's Brian Pritchard. Um, he lives north of us, but he gets a kiddie pool and he just fills it with water instead of just drenching it with a water hose, he puts all his leaves or straw or whatever in the kiddie pool and then lifts those up and then puts them in the, in the, um, uh, in the compost pile as he's creating it. That's gonna be great for the dryland climate. You get, if you do it with your hands, you're gonna get dirty as all mess, which is fine. Uh, the, tannic, the tannins and the tannic acid is probably good for you. So if you're in a water conservation mode where you're not you know, getting 40 inches of rain or something a year, that's definitely a method that's gonna be very useful for you. All right, so once you got your big fat cap and it's wetted down of carbon on the bottom, then uh, your ratio that you want to focus on here when it comes to greens to browns, greens, you're going to do one part to, let's just say 25 to 30 parts, uh, right? So that looks like one to 25, right? Greens, browns. Right, so we have a big old fat cap on the bottom that's kind of ignoring this. We'll go over that in a minute. But then you need your one part greens here. Make a little layer. And then on top of that, now you have your 25 parts browns that goes on top of that. And then you have your one part greens. And as you do this, you know, it's the carbon and the stuff's gonna be filling over the sides. You wanna try not to have a bunch of green here on the ground, right? You wanna try to keep the green up in here it's okay if the browns come down. Again, we're gonna put a little layer of green and then another layer of brown. So eventually we're gonna keep doing this using um, the material that we have until we have, a, uh, you know, you're looking at, at about one cubic yard, uh, right? And so it's shaped as a little cone, uh, uh, an upside down cone is what you're seeing here. I'll go ahead and do this for a second because there's one bit of important thing here. All right, so once you get up at the top, just like you did at the bottom, you want a big fat cap here on the top too. And that's gonna surround the whole thing. It's gonna protect it, help keep the smells away, your rodents away, like that, right? So 
Um, the circle it makes on the ground is about five and a half feet in diameter, right? Depending on the materials you, you use, it will also be that high. But if you're using lots of wet, straw is going to be better. You, you can potentially get that high in straw, but if you're using leaves, it's going to start weighing itself down and compressing. So remember, it's about 12 to 15 bags of leaves. All right, so now that we've built it, we've got to put a, uh, that tarp over it. So just put the tarp over it. And you'll need something heavy, like a rock or a log, to hold it down. Right? So we put it like that, the rocks out over the tarp. And then you've made it. You're here. You're at day one. This is the creation of your thermophilic Berkeley-style 18-day compost. But there's a time, this is a strategy, so it's a timed event. So let's go over that for a second. 18 days, right? Here's day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, your first week, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So right now you are here. We just created this on day one. I recommend doing these once a month if you can. If it gets really cold and if it, you have, I've only had one ever freeze in my region. Uh, I made it in like January, something like that. But other than that, I've never had one, any issues. Now the colder climates, obviously, if you start making this in the, in the winter time, make it in your greenhouse. It'll help heat your greenhouse up as well. Um, but if you can make one of these a month strictly for your garden, um, I would tell you that the five or so years that we had the backyard going in our old suburban site, almost everything was made on site. I like 95 to 97, 98% of all the garden beds were created in this method. And they just kept getting better and better every year. Um, so make as many of these as you can. All right, so we've made it, we've tarped it, and we've left it alone. You don't add anything to it or take anything away once you've started unless you're having some problems. Like if it's too dry, you add a little bit more water. If it's too hot, you know, you add a little bit more carbon. But for the most part, you're not dumping in a lot more stuff. So now on day four, you leave it alone for day four. What you're going to do is you're gonna take the tarp off, just move it over to the side. Don't fold it up, leave it straight if you can. In other words, just grab it from here, take the rocks off and just pull it and leave it. It makes it a lot easier to put it back on when you're finished and you have to put it back on in a minute. Then this outer fat cap that we had, this big one, you're gonna take that and you're going to just walk around and with your hay fork, pull that up and start moving that right here and make another fat cap on the bottom. Right, so that's what you did, replacing the caps. Now, once you get to the inner, uh, uh, the inner layers, you get the greens and the browns, just put a hay fork in there and just start dumping it all over here. So that's fine. That's going to be now, it's going to be a, a combination of, you know, there's not going to be layers anymore. Just the greens and the browns, it's going to be all interwoven. And when you get down to this bottom fat cap, the first one we put on, you probably guessed it from now, now you take this bottom fat cap and you make another one here on the top. Again, if you need to wet it down a little bit each layer, that's great. You don't want it totally drenched here. Come back by, put the tarp over it again. Right? And then you let it sit. This time you let it sit for two days. Now there's some work involved in this, but it's like, free high quality fertilizer that you don't have to go out and buy stuff. And let's just say there's nothing to buy, right? So you can do this if you have zero money in anywhere in the world. It works in all the, the climate regions. Uh, pay attention to your water usage and dry lands. And if there's nothing to buy, this is going to work for you. So now every two days, you're gonna do the same thing that we just did on day four, right? So day four, day six, day eight, day 10, 12, 14, 16, and on day 18, you have compost that is ready to plant in that you can use for a garden. As a matter of fact, there's your four foot by eight foot garden bed. 
Now, I don't want to get too advanced, right? But you know, you've got the four foot by eight foot garden bed. It's like 32 square feet. You can also use this for a uh, eight, eight and a half diameter circle bed. Uh, where this one, the rectangular beds, you work the outside perimeter. This one, you go into the middle and you rotate around, working just from one area. Um, you know, and at this quantity, you actually get more plants with that one. But um, <clears throat> you know, we don't have to get too involved in that. It's a little, little more advanced than just really basic. All right. Just to make sure everything's good. Uh, how we doing folks? Uh, let me know you're here. Uh, I'm going to move into the next lesson. I just want to know there's, we're all good. Give me a uh, uh, compost is awesome uh, message. You guys rock. If, if you want to, you can just play some air guitar right at home, right? That's how you know you're, you're really getting into growing. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you now about another fertilizer process. And the technical name on it is vermiculture. And what this really means, it's the study of worms, right? So Darwin, his last book was uh, leaf mold uh, and, and earthworms, it was about earthworms. And then <clears throat> I wanna say it was 1912, right? the real kind of first book on earthworms came to be and then it got repopularized and I believe 42 by um, Apple Hoff and she wrote a book that made it very accessible to everybody um, but in any case worm farming that's what we're doing and we're going to do you know if you're on a large scale use bathtubs if you're on a small scale use uh, small sinks so that's kind of the first thing that we want to look at here. Um, all right, so let's take a little sink. Um, if, you, if you look up my name and Worm Farm, you'll see both a, a, an operation that's a, a commercial operation, and then you'll see a backyard version that I did on the video. And I'm basically gonna walk you through that right now. So we just went and bought a little sink from a big box store. It's one of those utility sinks you usually put in the garage. It had some legs on it. And, and it stood up about belly button high, right? It's about that high. It had a little drain in it like that. Now, you know, same thing if you have a bathtub, right? you wanna put some cinder blocks on it. And then also it has a drain right there, right? So two different ways. Matter of fact, I'm just gonna go with the bathtub. It's easier to it's easy to, to make sense of. So that's the side view of it. And then here's the top view. Elevation view, aerial view. All right, so if you're on a farm, the first thing that you're gonna do is fill this almost all the way up. No, I'm sorry, that's not the first thing you're gonna do. You're going to plug the drain, but you're not gonna plug it to seal it um, in in like Amazon, there's a thing that you can put in the drain that's like stainless steel. It's like a sieve and it lets all the water go through all the dirty water, but it keeps all the food bits. You want, that's a really good thing to use right here, right? So it's like a little sink drain sieve. You put that in the, in the drain itself. And then I usually get like a shade cloth or hardware, or I'm sorry, shade cloth or landscape fabric. And I put it over that. So it's like, it's like it goes through a filter two filters right before it goes out and you want this lifted up off the ground you don't want it to put it in the ground this particular method there's lots of ways to do this by the way um, but in this method this is what you do so if you now that you've done that and then you, you know, make sure that doesn't move and your landscape fabric doesn't move right there then you fill almost all the way uh, leaving maybe like four inches from the top or something like that with raw manure right so if you're on the farm Cow manure is going to be your best, right? It's raw cow manure. If you are not, and you are in the suburb of the rural, urban area, and if you're even on a farm, when you make that compost that I had talked about earlier, you're going to not do it right your first five times, which is totally okay. 
you're not going to mess it up too bad because compost happens no matter what, right? So it's going to work itself out. You're going to be just fine. It's going to, it's going to be awesome. So, but especially like, you know, you made it and let's say you made two at a time. One of them was better than the other. Take that old one. So it's kind of like a half broken down compost and use that as your base material. So some people call it bedding or base material. It's the daily food for the worms. That's what you're putting in right now, right? So that's, that's the bulk of what you have in your worm farm. Now you have to understand what comes out of the back end of worms is the best fertilizer on earth. There isn't a better one. Now, in order to get that fertilizer, you're gonna to have to pay for it with a little bit of work uh, because they're finicky. They won't eat all the, the, the waste products like the compost will, but it's worth it because this is black gold. Uh, this is, you know, I mean, think about it. We're mimicking nature. They create fertilization at the root level of all plants and they do it in nature anyhow. Um, I, I think it was in Egypt, I, I believe, if I'm remembering, Cleopatra had made it a crime to, uh, to purposely kill earthworms. And it wasn't for religious reasons, it was because of the fertility. Don't quote me on that, um, but I do know it, it, in Europe, the price of, of land was directly correlated to one spades with, or one, spade, one shovel full of earth and how many earthworms were in it. Right. So that shows you the fertility of the soil. And so current agriculture just absolutely, it just, it, it literally rips those worms apart and then takes the organic matter. So we're specifically looking at composting worms, okay? Composting worms, like red wigglers. Now they're part of the, they're earthworms, but they're a section of earthworms that only eats organic matter. Where earthworm earthworms eat earth. And as they eat the earth, they actually eat the poop of the composting worms and extract the nutrients from that. Those worm castings are good too. And you see those up on the top of the soil all the time, those little tiny little uh, volcanoes or little mountains that are like little pebbles. Those are earthworm poop. So composting worms are different. They're a little bit finicky. They like, you know, between like 65 to 75-ish degrees temperature. So if it's too hot, you got to take them, you know, at least with a small sink, you can take it and move it around. Some people do it in the tub that you can move around. Some people, if it's always cold, you put it in the greenhouse. Um, you know, I, we would move ours either in the summertime, we'd put them under the shade. In the wintertime, we'd bring them into the garage. They go, they go not dormant, they just slow way down in the, the heat and they slow way down in the cold. So they are, that's what I mean by you got to pay for it a little bit. Also, we can just do a quick what they can and cannot eat. Right, so we'll do another little matrix here. Right, what they can and what they cannot. Let's start with what they cannot. Um, <clears throat> now this is you know, up for debate, but the first one would be dairy. Right? Citrus, right? you use lemon peels, grapefruit peels, anything like that. Uh, anything in the capsicum family, which is peppers. Right, no peppers. And the alliums, uh, let's just say the, the garlic or the onion family. These are the big ones, right? You got to keep those out of there. So you got to separate those where the compost pile doesn't matter. It eats everything. This one, you got to separate this out. So you, you know, if you're making, a, or say if you're juicing, you're doing a juice fast, uh, but you're also putting your, your pineapple, which is a different kind of citrus, but uh, or, or say you're, you're juicing lemons or something through there as well. You, need, you don't want to feed that pulp to your worms. Now all the kale pulp and spinach and dandelion greens and sweet potato, like all the little peelings, like that's great, like no big deal there, right? So really that's, that's how you want to look at it. So you're feeding them daily then, every day, uh, you, both, you can go, maybe one day you choose to go to the compost pile with all your kitchen scraps and the next day you separate it out and then every day you put, you know, you're safe to eat kitchen scraps on your worm farm. And then on top of that, um, you need some type of cover on this and you want to keep that cover a little bit moist. When you put the bedding in here, you know, you want it to be moist as well. You don't want it to be saturated because worms can drown but you want it to be moist and they create moisture themselves. 
Uh, you can use a burlap sack here or burlap sacks to cover it. It's to keep the light off. They're photophobic, meaning the light actually hurts them. So in any case, um, you know, so the checks, it, it, once you know what not to feed them, this becomes easy to know, right? So you know, easy one, grated carrots, all of the tops of the vegetables that you don't eat, they eat all that organic matter, right? Uh, parts of your compost that are not doing good, leaves, uh, you know, dried leaves, all of that's great. Fantastic. Uh, if you have, you know, after Halloween, you got all those the places that do Halloween, you got all of those pumpkins, right? Pumpkins are great to throw in there. And sometimes you get a couple of pumpkin seeds to sprout. It's very fantastic. In your region, once you, you know, once you add the worms in here, you're usually going to buy them, right? And so um, let me give a shout out to Heather Rinaldi at Texas worm farm.com. And listen, guys, she's awesome. She's really into this. She's also hurt from the, um, from the recession that's happening right now. So uh, in order to, you know, to keep the doors on, or to keep the lights on, recommend if you're going to buy some of these, go to texaswormfarm.com. And you can purchase right there. And I think she now ships. She didn't use to ship because she was so focused on the integrity of her worms. Um, so you can go grab those from Heather and you can get some really good worms that have been taken care of uh, their whole life. All right, so now we put some worms in here. And <clears throat> you can put a little watering can right here. And that watering can, what will end up happening is they'll create moisture. And if you ever need to come through here and, and give it some moisture, or say this is in your greenhouse, you have an automatic misting system that gets moisture in it, the excess moisture will drain out. Now, as long as, you know, you know <clears throat> the more rotten kitchen scraps you put on the top, the more bacteria that's not good for you will be in this. But typically, it's going to be fine. You're, you're going through big bedding. All of this liquid effluent is like black liquid gold. So this can be put right onto the soil parts of your plants um, or even the tops of your plants. You can cut it like two or uh, two to one with rainwater or good water, which is full of microorganisms, right? They're heavy, their poop is heavy in bacteria. All right, so then the question is, all right, now once they've eaten through all of this, then it's all their poop. They created it all to poop and every living organism dies in its own poop. So you've got to change the castings out and that's what the castings are, right? So that's the really good stuff. So what you do is you, one, one way to do this, there's multiple ways. There's a, there's a change system, but we're going to talk about a really low tech system now. Just take the burlap sacks or whatever it is and put them into one corner over here, right? And what you've effectively done is you've opened up this to the sun. Now they don't like the sun. So all those earthworms, not all of them, but the majority will come and hang out underneath this because it's still shady. So leave it exposed for 24 to 48 hours. Now, <clears throat> then you come in here and you start harvesting this, uh, put it in a wheelbarrow. And then when you put it on the garden, when you put it on the garden itself, you want to either put it on and then add mulch or you want to scrape off the top, put the worm, uh, all right, so this is worm castings, and then you wanna put mulch on top of it. So where compost itself can be both a compost and a mulch, worm castings are not a mulch. They are, uh, you need to take care of them, keep them out of the sun. So you want, when you put this on your garden bed, you need to cover those up. All right, so you're pulling those out, and then now all your worms are here. Um, you can just leave that there, or you can pull those out as well if you, need, you wanna separate that into a, a second system. Uh, but then you fill this back up, back with your original bedding material, whether it be cow manure or a bunch of half rotten compost or, or something like that. And depending on how hot it is, depending on how often you got to change it and how, how big the area is as well. So, you know, a, a bathtub full, it could be as quick as three months to six months before you have to change it back out. A smaller sink, you're going to be changing more often, but it's worth it. You got two methods now that are natural, that are extremely fertile, that will help you in this preparedness garden. 
All right. I see we've got a number of questions. Keep, the, keep them coming. We'll spend some time at the end. I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit because we have a lot to talk about when it comes to uh, the crops. And that's what we're going to focus on right now. How many of you are ready to start your preparedness garden? Who's going to start this week? Let me know in the comments who's starting their preparedness garden this week. All right, I'm looking at those messages here. You guys are rocking out. Lots of people starting, um, starting this, um, <clears throat> this preparedness garden. Remember, once I get through these, I got some important tips here at the very end for the preparedness garden and why I don't, remember again, I talked about why it's not a victory garden and the way that the victory gardens choose to grow food and why that's so important and that you won't see me doing it, not because I have anything against it, or maybe we can call this preparedness garden, I, I don't care, or it's a victory garden 2.0, right? You know, just make sure you pay attention to those tips at the very end for that. Okay, so the first one, we're just gonna go in alphabetical order, alphabetical order. Beans, it's hard to see. Beans. Now there's two types. There's a pole bean and there's a bush bean. Now they're both beans, but one, uh, this one vines up a pole right, or a trellis or a bush bean makes a little plant. They both have their pros and cons, but for the most part, they're the same. Um, and you, know, you can utilize one over the other in different situations. Like if you have a fence that you're not doing anything with, like a chain link fence, well, all of a sudden now that becomes a trellis for your beans, right? For pole beans. So it doesn't really matter which one of these you use, just depends on the, the operation. But beans themselves are a long-term storage crop. They've been used multiple cultures across time and they're easy to grow and they help you build soil. They're in the legume family. So um, they actually, without getting into too much technical detail, they put nitrogen in the soil for you. They put fertilizer in the soil for you. Uh, it's just an amazing thing that they do. So they help build soil. All right. So it doesn't matter which one, but your spacing on either one, you want a six inch diamond, and I'm, let me explain this, diamond pattern. So what that means is, so you've got your, your, your bed and then you're starting to put the seeds in the ground. So you go, here's your first seed and then you come over, this one would be six inches. And then from six inches to this one and six inches to this one, it makes that. And then six inches from this one, so it makes that. And like this, right? So this is what's called the diamond pattern, like six inch on center or something like this. And the way it's called the diamond pattern because you can see it makes 
a diamond, right? Like that. And you can really, ex you know, you can get a couple more plants in by using this pattern. And there's multiple ways to plant, but this is a really easy one to understand. Rather than just doing rows like this, you still can, but maybe six inches, six inches, six inches apart like that. Six inches, right? So you still got your rows if you want to do it that way. And then you also have your, your diamond pattern here. This extends how many plants that you can actually put into your garden. On the curved garden beds, it looks a little bit different, but you get the, get the point here. And I'm going to be utilizing a lot of this diamond pattern in this scenario. Um, you know, kind of looking at what grow biointensive, what John Jevons has created and all the research he's done into stacking as many plants in as possible. That's where you're going to get most of the spacing other than a couple of the plants. All right, so time to maturity. These take about, no, oh, well, hold on, let me back up for a second. This, for, I'm going to give you two types of plants. I already give you the seeds from earlier. Now, the two, this is going to break down into two categories, right? long term and then in a minute I'm going to give you short term okay now remember all the criteria that we talked about before that's what we're focusing on right now and then I'm going to give you a bonus set of the short term ones here so this is going to sustain you for a longer period of time right and it stores it's good stuff so time to maturity is eight to ten weeks depending on variety and if you use flats that are a little if you're using baby seedlings rather than right into the ground, right? So eight to 10 weeks, we got it. Now what you eat, um, you can take the beans while they're still green and soft on the plant and you can pull those off. You can eat them fresh, you can cook them. Matter of fact, all beans are kind of green beans if you harvest them like that. Um, and then once you have the seed, the, so you can eat them fresh, right? And then dried beans. You can do the dried beans and that's, you know, when you're making like refried beans and I tell you, dried beans are excellent. Uh, you mix them with a fat, you know, a lot of people use lard or bacon grease or tallow or even coconut oil. Um, and mix them with a the fat and they, they, they really shine with just a little bit of salt and pepper on their own and they can store for a long time. You can make soups with them. That's fantastic. So the way you save the seed, um, you know, you can just let a whole plant go to seed, but let me, let, I'll go ahead and give you a kind of a more, a little bit more advanced here because it's not hard to do on this one. Once you see the, the seed parts start drying out or right before that, pick a couple of plants or, or least, maybe even from all your plants. Uh, as you're taking the fresh ones off, you leave maybe seven to 10 pods on each plant that you know you're going to let go to seed. And maybe it's the ones that are at the bottom because that makes it easy to identify them or the ones that are at the top, whatever you choose to do. And what this does is as the plant is creating seed and you're pulling off the other one, say, say, say it created 30 seed pods for one plant or 60, but then you've pulled off all those seed pods and it's only, now it's only focusing on seven to 10. Now it can really put its energy into creating those seeds. And that's a kind of a, a, a thing to do. You don't have to do it at all, but it's something to do with, you know, kind of think about with all the plants and you're wanting to, to grow really healthy seeds. So in other words, just wait till the plant is, the seed pods have dried out, pods dry out, and then you pull them off, you pull them off the plant, you put them in like a bucket or something. And then uh, you let them, once you do that, then you let them dry two weeks more off of the plant. And then you, you know, shell the beans. You take them out of their pods and you store them in a jar. You know, most, a lot of people do it in a glass jar in a dark, cool, dry place. And you're gonna, that's, that is a common denominator on most of these here. And you can eat them throughout the winter, you know, and if you have, a, you, beans are very prolific, so you can have a whole bunch. And then you gotta make sure that you save the ones that you're gonna replant. And a little tip here too, is any of the seeds that you wanna replant, you don't actually wanna eat the, as you're paying attention now to the plants as they grow, look at the one that ticked off the best. It stayed healthy, the pests didn't eat it, didn't have any diseases. 
if it was a drought time, it didn't care about any of that, right? So it's a hardy plant. That's the one you definitely want to save the seed from, right? Or multiple seeds if you can. While we're talking about that, what kind of seeds do you want to buy, right? If you're going to buy them. So here's hybrids, hybrid seeds. No, stay away from hybrid seeds for this type of operation. All right, what you want to look at is open pollinated seeds. And the reason that we want to focus on those is because those seed, the hybrids, a lot of the times they, they when they, if they create seeds, it's sterile. Um, or they don't, they're not very good for saving the seed and replanting. Where your open pollinated seeds, those are specifically made to be pollinated again while they're on the plant so you can save them and replant them. So I'm gonna get, so some of the, uh, in the United States, some of the big ones that you can go to is like Baker Creek Seed Company. You can go to Johnny Seeds. You can find good seeds there. Um, if you're in the Southern region of the United States in the Blackland Prairie, like we are here, um, I'm gonna recommend Brim Seed Company. You can go to brimseed.com. And she's, you know, look for the ones that are Southern acclimated on her website. She's a very small operation and she's been growing these Southern acclimated ones for 10 plus years, right? So open pollinated is good. And if you get open pollinated heirloom, that's really the best. But once you have an heirloom and then you grow it in the same soil or in climate for three successive generations, then the best kind of seed are called land race seeds, right? And so these are the, these are the ones you want to focus on, right? And open pollinated is like a type and heirloom means it's like been selected for that flavor, for the drought resistance, the pest resistance, the hardiness, all that stuff, like what you're doing when you say seed. And then when you do it in at least three successive generations, uh, then you've got a land race. And that's what you want to share with your friends locally. Um, those are excellent seeds. And just stay away from these as much as possible. Now, if that's all you can purchase right now, I get it, like do what you gotta do. But um, this is really, really what you're focusing on. <clears throat> All right, corn. Corn is awesome. <clears throat> There's many different types of corn. What you want to focus on here is the sweet and even the field corn, the sweet and um, we'll just call it dent corn. It could be yellow or white um, in here. <clears throat> the difference between the two, sweet corn is typically grown so you can harvest it right before it's ripe or dried out. You harvest it when it's either young uh, or when it's mature, but it's grown to mainly eat fresh. You eat it fresh. Uh, you can save this as well by freezing it uh, off the cob. Where dent corn or field corn is usually grown to dry out and grind into making a meal. Um, so that's something to look at here. So both of them are going to be great. If you, if you want one that will last the longest, it's going to be dent corn. And you might be able to find a variety like Hickory King that it's a dent corn, it's a field corn, but when you harvest it, when it's not quite, uh, when, it's, when it's fresh and young, it tastes just like a sweet corn. But then, right, so it's kind of dual purpose. And as it dries on the stock, it becomes a more storable meal type corn, like to make cornbreads and things like that. So uh, here on the spacing, so there's a lot of ways to do this here. You can do, um, let's just say 12 to 15 inch spacing. 12 to 15 inch spacing in a diamond pattern. <clears throat> and this is an interesting one because once you put your 
12 to 15 inch space and in a diamond pattern, you can do something kind of fun here. You've got at least six inches away, you've got, you know, so this is at least 12 inches here. Once the, this corn gets up out of the ground and gets about six inches tall, then in between the two, you can put a pole beam. Right, about, about six inches away from the plant. So wait until the corn six inches high and then put your, your beans in there. And the Native Americans of the United States obviously used the three sisters. Um, it was a plants that grew well together. It was beans, corn, and squash. So for right now, this is just utilizing the two. And so you can use the pole bean to end up, it'll end up climbing up the, the corn without taking anything away from the corn. And the bean will help fertilize the corn, which is a heavy feeder, meaning it likes a lot of uh, fertilization. So the time to maturity, you got about nine to 14 weeks on this one. What you eat are the, the kernels. You eat the kernels off the cobs. And so there's a little bit of work involved here. You wait, once it's mature, it's, it's obviously the green parts have died back. Uh, you should be able to crack it off from the bottom. Um, and then you pull the husk down. They make little rings for this too. Where you, you can de-husk it or sh uh, shuck it quickly. And then you've got the cob. Now you can just store that cob, but it's usually better to, once it's dry, to, to uh, the words escaping my brain right now, to take the kernels off the cob, right? To take them off the cob. You can do that with a knife. You can do that with a, uh, a corn cobber you can buy from the store. So you wanna do that. Now you gotta be careful when you take the, the kernels off the cob. And the reason is that the kernels themselves, if you break them, you can't save them as seed. Okay? So you're going to eat the kernels. Now, if it's sweet corn, um, you can eat them fresh. You can, that's where you make corn on the cob with, with sweet corn, right? Where you put the butter on, you see the vendors you got uh, purchased. But you can also freeze fresh sweet corn, right? You can freeze fresh. And then you can save the seed just like the beans on the dent corn. So that's something to think about there. Or, or here we get to here, freeze. No, 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 that's what you eat. So this will last you to a long time. So you can even defrost the fresh ones and you have fresh corn again, just like if you were to purchase frozen corn in your grocery section, it's basically like this. Now to save it, you just take it off, you shell it while it's dry and then you put it in a jar, right? So just make sure it's dry and off of cob. And again, put it, you can put this in a jar in a dark, cool, dry place. There's corn. Okay, so garlic. Now this is, remember I put an asterisk by that earlier. Garlic is an oddity. So yes, there are garlic seeds. Hardly anybody plants them. Usually you're, you're, uh, you're, you're growing the, you're getting the clove, right? You take a clove out and you put it in the ground. Like that's no big deal uh, whatsoever there. On this one, you can use a four inch diamond pattern. Right? A four inch diamond pattern. Now it takes a while because it's 17 to up to 44 weeks. Now remember there's 52 weeks in a year, right? Um, so that's the deal with that. But here's the interesting deal is when. This one is the one that you can't do right now. Really, you need to plant this in the ground in the fall. So it's still on here and you can get it ready in the fall. But this is a really good medicine and it's, and it, it, uh, that's mainly why we have it here during these times where uh, viruses and, and flus and colds are going to be a problem. This will help boost your immune system. So when to plant? You plant it in the fall, four inches apart, just pop the clove in the ground, and it'll pop out. 
So what you can eat, you can obviously eat the, the cloves, right? Like we all do. And then you can eat the scapes, which is just, it's kind of like the flower of the, of the plant. So it grows up, it's in the onion family and it pops out this little, almost kind of upside down looking garlic shape, uh, but they're called scapes. And you can uh, put those, uh, saute them down. There's a, a variety of ways to, 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 to cook the scapes. So you get two, two things to harvest here. To save the seed, once the, uh, the top of the plant starts browning and going dormant, it's the time, it's about the time to go ahead and pull them out. And it doesn't matter if you're using a soft neck or a hard neck variety, really it doesn't matter at this point. Um, you wanna take those and at least put them in the bundles, or if you know how to braid them, you can make a, a garlic braid. And you could start eating those right away, but then you can save them as well. And some of them will start sprouting in the kitchen or wherever you're storing them. So those really don't last for more than a year uh, when you save the seeds. So you actually save the cloves, um, the cloves within the bulb, right? Within the bulb. And you wanna store those. Um, oftentimes you can store them hanging, somewhere hanging in a dry, um, cool place. And this this one doesn't have to be dark, but just out of the sun, out of the sun. Garlic's an excellent plant. How many of you guys eat garlic on a regular basis? And what do you eat it for? Excellent potato with an asterisk. Way to go, Rebecca. Yeah, Brenda, Marie, Renee, yeah, garlic. Oh, and pesto, Barbara Wilson. Yeah, absolutely. There you go, George. Breaks down the Allison. Infuse it with honey. Oh my goodness, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, good feedback. There's gonna be lots of uh, variety of knowledge in this in this session. Okay, so the potato. Now the potato is an interesting one. Um, find a variety that is good in your area. So um, like for example, I'm just going to give you a variety that we have here, like the Kennebec. Does really well uh, here in, in the southern, the northern part of Texas where we're at now. You got Yukon Golds, you have things like that. Where you maybe want to stay away from is like don't uh, don't use the russet, right? Where it's good eating, but the russet is um, it's made by Luther Burbank, so so really to be commercialized, so it's long, but it's susceptible to fungus attack and the, the usually the herbicide, I'm sorry, the fungicide that's used on it is just so toxic. It's called Monitor. So just you know you don't really need to use the russet. Uh, but you look for some heirloom varieties. I, I want to say it's Mary's potatoes or Mary's heirlooms. I bought potatoes from her one time um, and that they came out really well. But you, like, we have a thing called tractor supply here in our region or some places it's Menards. Uh, they just have you know, for five bucks, you get like a 10 pound bag of potatoes. Uh, you just go grab those there. Now those probably weren't grown organically, but starting from you, they can be grown organically. So this one are going to be nine inch spacing on a diamond pattern, and these are nine inches deep. So now you know why I kind of want to get you to put that at least 12 inches deep for a variety of reasons, but this is good. Um, now these mature within, uh, say, depending on the variety, nine to 19 weeks. And you can pull them out a little early and get new potatoes or baby potatoes. <clears throat> but you want to let them go into the ground. And, you know, each potato will give you anywhere from three to 10 potatoes. So uh, that's great. And what you eat are the roots and you don't want them green and don't eat the top parts of this um, because they have a uh, constituent in it that's not so good for humans. 
But the, the thing on this is the way you save the seed and the way you plant it, we need to talk about that on potatoes and those sweet potatoes. So you save the seed by, um, this one is you just store some potatoes and you don't eat them and they end up developing eyes and new shoots later. But let's just say this is your, your potato and your potato, um, I mean, I have some in the other room, I might go grab them. Matter of fact, let me go grab that real quick. All right, so here's what a bag looks like just from, and if you have a local grower that's growing seed potatoes for you, that's great. So this is what a seed potato looks like. Most people don't grow seed potatoes from the seed. They grow them from seed potatoes. Uh, there's a way to, to use this string, but the string is outsmarting me today. So now these have big old eyes that have already developed stems, right? But this is a seed potato. It's very soft, very soft. You can see like that's an eye, that's an eye, that's an eye. These are eyes that are already just growing into plants, right? And so what I'll do is I'll come with a sharp knife and something this big, I could make this into four, right? So you wanna go between one to two inch pieces at the smallest, but if you have a lot of them, just you just wanna make sure it has eyes on the part. So you could just chop this in half and you got two seed potatoes, right? So each seed potato usually is two seed potatoes. And so that's what you're doing. Now, once you have um, cut them into the pieces, what you'll end up doing is taking a table. And so here's a table for you. And put down some cardboard or paper over it and put up a box fan right here and set those little pieces in front of that box fan and try not to have them touching if possible and let them just get cool air blown on them for 24 hours. What you're doing is you're everywhere you slice the potato, use a sharp knife uh, by putting that cool air over them. You want them to, it'll scab over. Um, so once it starts scabbing over, it might turn black a little bit. That's great. So you don't want to do it for maybe more than 48 hours if possible. And you don't want to do that when it's too cold. Now, now these, they don't mind a cool temperature when you plant them, because they're planting them so deep. But now once they've scabbed over, and some people like dip them in ash to help, uh, to help any fung fungus or any disease that might get them while they're cut. Uh, but you know, I've, I've just done the drying method. And then each one of those little pieces you plant in a diamond pattern, just like that. So you save the seed from the old potatoes themselves and your storage. Now, actually they like a little bit of humidity, but I will tell you, same thing. You want them out of the sun. So this one you do want dark, uh, cool, ventilated um, and dry, right? Where the dry is a little bit questionable, but for right now, we're talking really basic stuff. Uh, uh, dry area is no big deal. Potatoes, a great storage crop. This has helped multiple people uh, live through famines, multiple civilizations, and they're exceptionally easy to grow. Just find a hardy species that's in your region. All right, so now, I've got to do the hands down the best crop on here. Sweet potatoes. If you now, where do you get them, right? You can purchase them from a place like uh, they can find online, but honestly, just get an organic sweet potato. And this goes for potatoes at the store too. Just get organic potatoes, or organic sweet potatoes at the store. Now, you don't want to get non organic on these because they usually are sprayed with a growth inhibitor. So you need to get organic to make sure it's not been sprayed with that if you can't find a supplier. Um, so the Japanese sweet potatoes are a little bit smaller. They're usually purple skin, 
But the one thing about those Japanese sweet potatoes that I have found out, it's a really good type to get. Now, all of them are going to work. They're a super hardy plant. Like you, you have a hard time messing up growing sweet potatoes. They take a little bit more work than all the other ones, but it's still simple. And what you get from the sweet potato is better than any of the crops I've mentioned. It's a super food. Um, but once it's starting to, to grow in the soil and it gets a little bit big, and let's just say you're keeping it in the ground for a little long time, uh, for a longer time, and it starts to rain a whole bunch, they'll split. And then once they split, they get infected with bugs. But the Japanese, I've had the least amount of splitting on. The Jap and usually you can get those at organic stores to, to eat. They're really hardy growers. Right? So the same thing here, you want a nine inch diamond pattern. Uh, but this, these are going to be six inches deep. Now, you don't actually plant, you can plant the potatoes, but not typically. And we're going to go over how to, um, how to do all that as well. Um, you've got this one, though, it's a long term. This is four to six months. All right, so you eat the roots, obviously, but you also eat the leaves. Now, this is the, it's like the gift that keeps giving. <clears throat> so the roots take a long time to grow, but as it's growing through the summer, they have more leaves than, than you know what to do with. So those leaves are, you can eat them raw or you can eat them cooked um, to wilt them down just like spinach or something like that. So um, highly recommend that. You get a double crop there and it's a long term crop. It, it gives and gives and gives and it stores really well. But here's the thing about the, the how to plant them. You don't really plant the the potatoes. You plant what's called a slip, a sweet potato slip. So you, what, how it's normally taught is you, and I'm going to show you a better way. You take your sweet potato and you cut it in half. And then once it's cut in half, you take like a mason jar and you fill that with water and you set that half of the sweet potato in there. And then you put your little toothpicks or something like that. And you wait till that starts to root out and uh, wait till it starts to root out. And then once it, and this could take like, you know, four to six weeks, and then it starts growing above the water, the slips like this. And once it has a number of slips, you know, six to 12 inches high, then you get a second mason jar. Fill that with water, and then you put all your slips in here. And then those start to root out. And when those start to root out, those are the slips that you put nine inches apart, six inches deep. I don't recommend doing that. It's way too much work. So what I do recommend, if you're on small scale, um, just get you a, a container. You know, you can make one out of fence slats. Um, so in other words, it's it's a not. If it's going to be plastic, you need to put some holes in it for drainage at the bottom. Get you a little bit of compost about an inch high off the bottom and then set as many sweet potatoes in there as you can. And then fill the rest of this with compost. So what will happen, and you just got to water it, right, to keep it moist, is this will start to grow slips. The sweet potatoes will. Now, once they get to six inches to 12 inches high, you just take them and lift, once you start to try to get the sweet potatoes out, the whole thing is like one mat, right? You have to like, it's just full of roots and the slips already have roots on them at this point. Now, that's the key thing. So you've missed a whole bunch of messy steps with water. You just had to do this, pull that up. Each one of these sweet potatoes gives you, you know, at least six, if not like up to 50 up to 50 different slips on it, right? And once you take some off, it'll continue to grow more slips, right? They've got a ton of energy reserves in the, in the root. So then you just take those slips, since they already have roots, and you plant them nine inches apart, uh, six inches deep. If you're small scale, you just do it in little flats like this, little, little boxes that are uh, porous at the bottom. Or if it's more large scale and you have the room, um, just take you a little plot, right? Let's just say you have a, 10 foot by 10 foot plot in the soil or in your garden, right? And then you just put down your sweet potatoes like that. And so now you have a, like a, 
like a nursery bed. It's the same thing here, but you're, instead of just doing four or so sweet potatoes at a time, each one of these lines is a sweet potato. All right, so you get a whole bunch and now you're ready to plant a couple acres full. Uh, sweet potatoes are amazing. If you have livestock, there's no reason not to grow sweet potatoes. Um, even if you have a pest problem, they help you with your um, feeding your livestock over the winter. <clears throat> so obviously the way you save seeds is the same way with potatoes. It's just old uh, potatoes, old sweet potatoes. And the storage is going to be similar to that of potato, dark, cool. And we'll go ahead and put dry, even though they actually like humidity. Now here's the thing on this. Once you harvest these sweet potatoes, you can eat right away. But most people let them uh, uh, season, they, they season them. What that means is you, you just store them for two weeks and it turns the starches to sugars and that's where it gets sweet. Um, so, and then they also say fancy things like, yeah, keep it at 80% humidity during this time. Look, I've just stored fresh sweet potatoes I've got out of the ground. I didn't wash them off, just hand dusted them off. Same with the potatoes, by the way, you don't want to wash them off before you store them. Just hand uh, brush them off. And I put them in a cardboard box on top of each other. Put, I didn't seal the lid, just, you know, you do that four flap thing on a cardboard box. Uh, and then I just put it in the garage and we ate on them all winter long, right? So uh, very easy to store, extremely hardy. And you just, you know, when it's time to put, put them in the ground to grow the slips or in the box, when it comes up uh, a little bit late in the winter or in the spring, go ahead and do it. Now, one thing that I would say there, you, you get good stuff to be in it. Like the worms is the best on earth. They're a little finicky. Where they're finicky is they will not tolerate cold. So you want it to have like a 60 degree temperature uh, in the soil. So uh, this is actually a tropical plant in the tropics. It, it's a perennial, but in the temperate climate, it's an annual. And the potatoes, going back to the potatoes, I want to tell you that won't actually work in the tropical climate because you can't store potatoes in a tropical climate. So you can still use sweet potatoes, but you change them out with uh, taro and cassava or juca root. You use those instead of potatoes in the, in the tropical climate. All right, how are we doing guys? Let's do a little check-in. Uh, if, if we're good, everything's going good, you can see this. Just say sweet potatoes are awesome. Awesome. All right, we got one more in this section and then I'm gonna <clears throat> uh, give you a couple of other things to think about and, and work on. So this one, we're gonna go wheat. Now wheat, this one will be your most labor intensive, but it's worth it um, if, if, you can, if you can work with it. And you only need 1 40th of an acre, right? That's just one long row. 1 40th, that's a very small size of an acre, to give you a bushel. And a bushel will last your family a four for a year, right? It'll take care of your needs. So this isn't a crazy crop that you've got to grow by the acres and acres and acres. Um, <clears throat> so um, the type, you want to go einkorn or emmer. Now there's, there's multiple types. There's, there's hard red types. There's, there's multiple types, but look, these are particular varieties. And the reason I'm telling you these varieties is because this is the oldest form of wheat that we know of. Modern day wheat, even the organic modern day wheat has a, uh, I believe it's a, a diploid uh, chromosome. And it has 42 chromosomes in it. But the most ancient form of wheat that we've harvested, like this is the wheat of the Bible. If it's not this, it's definitely that, right? But most likely it was einkorn. Um, this has 14, 14 chromosomes. How did we get from 14 to, to 42? Well, through hybridization and mutant foods. 
So I eat this, we've eaten it almost daily uh, here in the last month. And normally carbs just bog me down, right? But wheat is a grass and grass is the only plant on earth that can boast 90 of the 120 bioavailable minerals to humans. Um, not, I'm, I'm not saying wheat has that, but it, grass in general, no other plant can make such a boast on minerals. Uh, and that's why juicing the wheat grass is good for you as well. So get this. Now, I want to say taking the holes off of these two are harder than modern day. And that's where the work's really going to be at, right? So <clears throat> you need to look up further how to de-hole de these uh, when, when you get it. We don't have time today to go into all of that. Uh, most of the time, uh, wheat is sown in the winter or in the fall. It's called winter wheat. And you can do both of these. You sow them in the fall and uh, they grow a little bit and then they go dormant over winter. And then they, the same plants come back in spring and then you harvest it in the summertime. But with these two, it's both a winter and a spring wheat, meaning that you can put it in the ground right now. Right? You can put it in the ground right now. So if you're gonna to choose to put these in one seed at a time, you can do a five inch diamond pattern. However, I will want to tell you, you could also just do a solid stand. Now you'll lose a couple, but what this means is you just take the wheat kernels and you just broadcast them out, right? And then you're good. Um, so one of the places you can still get this online is adaptiveseeds.com. And they're in Oregon. They have both einkorn and emmer. Um, and if you want to purchase just the wheat itself, um, what is that mill down, down near San Marcos, Texas? They ship all over the country. I have to come back with you on that mill. Uh, we just bought some flour from there as well. Um, and if you guys know that in the comments here, uh, whatever that, uh, that mill, Barton Springs Mill, I think is what it is. Uh, that, Put their website out there if, if you know who they are. All right, so the time to maturity is depending on variety, 16 to 23 weeks. <clears throat> You're going to eat the grains. Now, these are also called berries, the wheat berries, for whatever reason, that's what they're called. And this, you save the, you know, you wait till it's somewhat dry on the plant and then you put it into bundles and then you hang it somewhere. Um, to let it dry. Um, so uh, you save dry on plant is when you harvest it into bundles to dry more and then you thresh it. Uh, yeah, this is, you know, like I said, this one takes a little bit more. Thresh the seeds off and you store them in a jar in a dry, cool dark place. Now you can actually cook the grains too, or cook the berries. You don't have to turn this into flour. Um, so um, this is the one that will use the most amount of work, but at the same time, these will last a long time. They're not going to go bad after one year. Um, and this type of, uh, the, the, the gluten that's in here is a completely different kind of gluten. So if people truly have a gluten sensitivity, they can usually take an iron corner or emmer, like no problem. It's a different thing, right? It's a whole nother animal. Uh, but like I said, the holes are the, are the biggest issue here, but they're great. They're almost brain food in our, in our household right now. All right, so that's the storage crops that we're working with here. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and give you another category. Well, before we do that, let's talk about some of some that didn't make the list out of this list. And that's gourds, pumpkins, squash. Now all of those are in the same family, the cucumber family, and carrots. So all of these are great. If in your region you can grow these with no problems, do it, right? But these ones in our region, not only do they have the squash bugs, but they have the squash, um, the squash vine borer. And it's just hard naturally to get rid of the squash vine borer. So that's something to think about. If you're in a region where you don't have a problem with that squash vine borer, grow these. They're excellent, just like all the other ones. 
uh, like butternut squash, kakuza. Some of those have a thick stem where you don't have to worry about the squash vine borer. Carrots are also really good, but the seeds are so small, it's like, it's hard to work with. But again, it's a really good storage crop. It lasts a long time and it's awesome. All right, so those are the storage crops. Let's just quickly go over the fast growing crops. I think it's actually more important to work on the category prior, the storage crops, because right now food is still available and it may still be available. But if you need food right away, here's a quick list for you. Beets, radish, turnips, now these, most people may not eat, but I will tell you with an oven and just some salt and pepper. So just take a radish, which is usually like uh, spicy and cut it this way, cut it that way. You have four pieces, right? They're a little, little, put some salt and pepper and a little bit of olive oil on a pan and roast them in the oven for just a little bit. They totally mellow out. And I'll tell you, you will love them. They are amazingly flavorful these watermelon rashes, the French dressing, all of them. So that's how you eat these like more spicy root crops, but that, that are, that still, these grow really fast, right? These radishes are, are extremely fast uh, growing. Some varieties you can get as early as 22 days in perfect condition. You also have the, um, the salad greens. And those are gonna be like, lettuce, kale, spinach, and Swiss chard. Now Swiss chard, let's talk about that for a second. He's a gift that keeps on giving. When my daughter was born, I planted, um, maybe a couple days prior to she was born, I put a little seedling in the ground that I started from seed of a Swiss chard. And when we moved away from that house, uh, she was like right around two years old. And that same Swiss chard was there healthy as can be still producing, right? So Swiss chard is a gift that keeps giving in the right climate. But all of these um, grow, oh, and arugula, in some parts of the world, world it's called rocket. And that's because it grows so fast, it's like a rocket, right? So all of these are your salad greens, that get you going right away. And all of these, you know, especially the chard, which is a more earthy flavor, all of them, you can, well, maybe not lettuce, but all of these that are high in nutrients, you could wilt them down in a pan with some salt and pepper and some butter. And it completely changes the flavor. So you don't have to eat these things raw at all, right? So fast growing crops, these will get you crops within 30 to 60 days, you'll have food here if, if you're really banging out. So now you know the crops, you know, you know the crops that you need to focus on. All right. <clears throat> what fun, what amazing things to think about, what amazing things that you can do. None of this is hard. The potatoes and the sweet potatoes take a little bit of work, but I showed you it's not hard. And those two crops give you a lot of food. Each sweet potato slip will give you, you know, three to 10 sweet potatoes on it. And those sweet potatoes can be this big and they can be this big, right? You get a lot of food there. You don't have to be fearful about trying to do this. You're gonna make mistakes, you can keep it. You can do it, you can do it. Make the mistakes, keep it going. The wheat would be the one that takes the most amount of work, but you know that's been around for a long time, right? We've been breaking bread for a long time, right? And we wanna to continue to do that. That growing all of these crops at an agricultural scale is, is very problematic, but growing them at a home scale in your homes, homestead garden is extremely beneficial. And I've shown you here how it's not so much work. It's really not, especially if you're, you know, you're gardening right out your back door. There are some very important tips that I want to bring up with these crops, and they're very important. Um, so let's go over those. So the first one is stagger your planting, right? So what does that mean? So like right now you can put seeds in the ground. Like I've, I got a bunch of potatoes in right now, but 
I'm putting potatoes in like every three or four days or every seven days. So in that whole window of when I can actually plant potatoes, and we've kind of passed it in our region, but we believe me, we could still do it. You know, put like, like I cut a bag open and I put that in, you know, two days ago, I put a bag in with a little, well, I actually, I cut them a couple days before I dried them with a fan and then I put them in the ground. And then I'm gonna cut up another bag today and in two more days, I'm gonna put that bag in the ground, right? So when it becomes time to harvest, uh, one, I'm, work, I'm lessening my work. I don't have to plant all at one time and I don't have to harvest all at one time. I could do it in little batches, right? A bag at a time. And then I, you know, so I'm not overworking myself. Also, if there is problems with, you know, potatoes, we don't have to worry so hard, but let's say it's something else like corn and it freezes. Well, all of those seeds you put in, prior to the, when it freezes, then you've got an issue. And, and all the things except the garlic that we talked about, I mean, let's just say in general, you want to put in after the last frost date. Some of them, you're not going to have to worry so bad. You can put it six weeks before the last frost date. And you can go to like Almanac or FarmersAlmanac.com, which by the way, is one of the oldest countries, the oldest businesses in the United States that's still running. And you can put your zip code in or wherever you're at in the world and find your last frost dates. These are very well-known dates, right? The average last frost date. Once you've passed that, you don't have to worry about frost in the ground anymore, killing the little plants. There's very frost tolerant plants too, like onions and things of that nature. But in general, you want to stagger the planting so you don't have to work so hard. And if there's problems, you still have crops that are growing and it also staggers the harvest. Um, like I mentioned before, choose heirloom and open pollinated seeds. Uh, these types of seeds allow you to save them year after year. And that's what we're trying to do. So one of the things that agriculture is terrible at is keeping soil fertility, fertility in. So with open pollinated seeds, it gives you the opportunity to continue to grow um, year after year after year. And then by creating these composts and these worm farms, it's always putting that fertility in the ground. So it's like a, you know, the compost and the worm farm eat the agri eat the food, the parts of the food that you don't eat, it eats those and turns those into fertilizer to go back into the garden, right? So it's like a cyclical series. And later on, I'll show you, because uh, we're not stopping these, I'll show you more advanced systems where you're working with animals and, and connections, really letting permaculture shine. But for the focus right now, it's for this preparedness garden. Uh, also, you want to Oh, and avoid the hybrids, avoid the hybrid seeds. Uh, choose late mid-season and early varieties if you can. And that's, and especially if you're all planting at one time, right? you can plant it early, mid, and that's, you harvest them at different times. That's also good. Rotations of crops. If you're going to do this year after year, it's more of a staged event, but it's paramount when you're talking about stuff like this. If you always have corn in the ground in the same plot of land, you're going to get the mosaic, uh, corn virus, I um, can't remember the, the entire name. You're gonna get pests that put eggs in the ground and just go year after year after that. It's the worst thing to do. You wanna rotate your crops over, right? So if you can, say you had 10, 12 garden beds, right? And then your first garden bed, you put corn. The next year, move four garden beds over and put corn in that bed, right? And so it's like a shift every year. So no one bed has the same uh, planting in it. Um, so also remember, you're going to need to water your garden, right? Don't forget to do that. It's going to get hot. So keep the water on your garden. Um, the compost is a mulch. So <clears throat> this is the crazy thing about that, right? If it's drought times, it holds water. If it's pouring rain, it sheds the water away, right? I got to kind of, there's no science behind exactly how that happens, right? There's no capillary action or nothing. Like it. it just happens. It's an amazing thing. It's like a miracle. So growing in this organic matter is going to very well benefit you. Now, some of the root crops don't care so much about growing in a, in a compost or something like that, but it's still going to work for you very well. Now, here's the one thing I want to tell you at the very end, um, uh, or when I started at the very beginning, we talked about victory gardens. Now, this is going to branch off into further learning because um, you're going to have to. Your first year or two, if there was in this preparedness garden uh, idea, you're going to grow some crops. Now, if, we, if I went only with the victory garden concept, 
I'm growing only food. And I've only talked about up until this point, only growing food right now. But when you're only growing food, you are creating a buffet line for the pests and disease. <clears throat> now the way to, that we've stopped it since the late 1800s is through, um, through chemicals, fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, all the side, like think about it, it names inside like homicide, right? Or, you know, infanticide. It's basically suicide by chemicals. So why do we want to use those? They're about killing life. My recommendation through experience and through my colleagues and through massive amounts of research is to grow an ecosystem. So around your garden, right? So you got a garden and here's a little hack. Just go to, um, if you're in the United States in the Midwest, you can go to seedsource.com and you can get native wildflowers. But just get native wildflower seeds that are on the side of the road, anywhere you are in the world. And I won't get into too much of how native species help attract all the pests, but I will tell you this, in my gardens, I have more pests than most people I know, but I have less pest damage. <clears throat> and that's because the ecosystem, these wildflowers, they create an ecosystemic design to create habitat to attract the things like the predators and the parasitoids like wasps and ladybugs and praying mantis and lacewings. And those insects eat the insects that are eating your crops. So I don't recommend the Victory Garden the way it's done. And that's because it needs to have a re reboot or just be a permaculture garden and create an ecosystem so you don't have to work so hard or bring chemicals in that are detrimental to your health. That needs another learning. I have more advanced learnings that I'm, I'm gonna be giving you for free through these. So you're on the email list now, I will let it be known. Uh, the next one, I think it's going to be, uh, <clears throat> you guys help me out in the, in the comments here. We have a friend who is an epidemiologist and she spent you know, her adult life in other countries working on the front lines, uh, literally the front lines of the Ebola crisis and SARS and all of this stuff. And so she was just on a local news station here. She happens to be in the United States. I think we're gonna bring her on and just talk about the, the actual, just the COVID-19, right? So uh, that may be the next one that happens maybe Tuesday, uh, depends. Uh, and or just an introduction into permaculture gardening, right? So it's a branch off, it's a step up, a little bit more advanced than what we're doing here now. And I have a slide deck, a slideshow for that, that I can show you. So, um, so yeah, <clears throat> there's, there's lots of free learning opportunities just by being on this email uh, address. If you know somebody who would benefit from this information, tell them to go to schoolofpermaculture.com and that pop-up that shows up or the bottom of every page, get on our email list. So I can email you reminders or email you when we're having these free classes just like this one. And I also want to give you an opportunity here that if you have, if you love this already, matter of fact, let me know in the comments, do you love this? Say, yes, I love this, or whatever you want to say right there. If you love this, then I'm going to give you a crazy amount of uh, opportunities, both for free, but also for uh, if you want to get certified. So if you want your permaculture design certificate, Right. Our online uh, class is going to be starting July 6th or 7th. I have to look at it again. Um, and through this email here, I'm going to email you a way to save. It's, it's, a, it's an $800 class and you'll get it for, um, by being part of this, you'll get it for, is it $400? Like you get 50% off or more, right? And that's if you want to take that. And a lot of people have responded to that already from one of these series that we did last week. So I want to give you that opportunity as well if you wanna get certified and go deep, like 72 hours of learning, uh, and then <clears throat> getting your questions answered here live with me. So uh, that's because we wanna help people. Um, so I, uh, I wanna say thank you and I love you. I put a blessing on you and I'm gonna uh, conclude the, the, the learning session, the sections of this, and we're gonna start the Q&A. So if you have a question, see there's 24 questions already in the Q&A put it there now. Um, you can also put them in the comments, but the comments go really fast. Um, so um, I, I'm, the, the, the Q&A section is gonna be the best part probably to look at that here. 
All right, so here we go. <clears throat> so this was very early on. It's from David Sturgill, or Sturgill, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce your name. And the question is, what at-home things can you do to analyze your soil? Okay, fair enough question. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, David, um, letting us know what part of the world you're in, and it could help me answer that a little bit. But in general, I'm going to make a an interesting statement. And that interesting statement is, um, don't worry about it. Even if you have the most marginal, degraded farmland that's been overgrazed and chemicalized, just start doing sheet mulching. And the, the microbiota in the soil will turn even the toxins, uh, will lock them up into a long carbon chain. So over time, it will be fine. So that's in general statement. I mean, there's obviously pH readers, there's hydrometers to measure the, the, um, the moisture level in your soil. There's different tests like the Berlazi uh, funnel is a test that you can cr make at home to look at the, it shows you in like a microorganism count that you can do there. And you can also get like uh, inorganic testing. Uh, you can purchase those kits online so you can see the NPK, the nitrous, phosphorus, and potassium, the inorganic loads that are in the soil. So those are some things that you can do at home. But, but I want you to know, like, if you're here and you don't have any experience, like, like, don't worry about any of that. Just put organic matter on the ground. Put a sheet mulch garden in and plant in that. And you're, you're, going, to be doing, you're going to be doing well, especially over time. It's like wine. It gets better year after year. And keep con making that compost and putting it on there. Okay, so the next one is from Barbara Wilson. Hi, Barbara. Uh, how do you keep the chickens from flying out of the electric fence? Do you clip their wings? Um, somebody in the chat, help me out here. There's a number of us on, it's still on here. Uh, find the Premier One Supply uh, poultry netting page or just even the website, Premier One. Um, <clears throat> so they have different gauges of height, um, you know, 42 inches, 48 inches high. For the most part, the chickens if they're fed, they don't have a reason to leave. They're gonna stay in there. They're gonna stay in. But if you do have an issue, you can clip one of their wings. Um, you know, the, the clippable feathers that you're supposed to. You can do both of them as well. But also choosing breeds that part of their intrinsic characteristics isn't to jump off and, and run away uh, or fly away. So that's probably good too. And most of the heritage or dual purpose birds like the Y and dots and the Orpingtons and the Rhode Island Reds. They are uh, birds that, that you know, of course you'll get a skittish one here or there, but they're used to being around people for, you know, a thousand years probably. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we, we didn't talk about chickens here um, because this is very basic uh, information about what to focus on for right now, but later on um, I couldn't, other than worms, I couldn't give you a better friend to your garden than the chicken with timing, with timing. Okay, good question. So here's another question from Linda uh, Furman. Um, glad you're here, Linda. It's what type of kitchen scraps, does this include pasta, meat, or just vegetables and fruits? If we're talking about the compost, yes, meat, uh, dairy, pasta, all of your old condiments that even have some chemicals in them that are moldy in the back of your fridge, all of those. Um, but if you're talking about the kitchen scraps for the, for the worms, uh, do go back and look at the replay for this uh, so we can go over that. Good question. Um, okay, so now here's another one from Shannon Linzag. Can you use horse manure instead of cow manure? I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I'm going to say yes, um, but if you're talking, I'm, what I'm saying, I'm not sure what you're talking about, was it in the composting or the garden or the worms? Um, yes to all those be, it's, it gets a little hotter because there's more nitrogen in horse manure. I'd say just be a little careful with it in the worm farm. And if you can, stick with the cow manure. Uh, here's a, a question from Kevin Neese. 
Um, hey, Kevin, what do you do? What do you do to plant into the following year? What about in three years? Do you keep adding layers, plant directly into what is left over, dig it out, or start over? Um, so I, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I quite understand the question because it sounds like there's a number of questions embedded within one larger, there's three question marks. But I think what you're asking is after you harvest the crop, what do you do with the agricultural waste or the rest of the crop? Usually you pull or cut those out at root level uh, and then take them to your composting area, either to be stored or to be put into your composting, either through compost or through a worm farm. Um, some of them you chop and drop, you can leave it right on, like, like straw, for example, or, hay or wheat, you can leave that straw right on the garden if you choose to. Um, so I, I, I hope I'm answering that question right. Um, if you can just ask another one, if, it's, if it wasn't answered and maybe if you can just, uh, be a little bit more precise and clear on the question. <clears throat> okay, so Brenda Bridwell, does the sheep mulch method attract fire ants and how do you get rid of them in the garden? Yeah, so fire ants are a big question in gardening. And so here is a permaculturist answer to fire ants and all ants for that matter, termites. Um, believe it or not, all ants um, create soil. So think about what they're doing. They're creating a mound above ground, but that mound above ground goes underground and they're creating all these pathways and they're bringing organic matter down in there and they're defecating in there and they're dying in there and they're having babies and or eggs and all this type of stuff. All that's organic matter and air infiltration and water infiltration. That's really good at root zone, right? So they're actually helping you. They're creating soil. And, and for the most part, if they're around your crops that are either leaf harvest or, or fruit harvest that's above ground, like tomatoes or eggplants or something like that, I would say if it's possible, just leave them alone. The only time they become problematic is when you have root crops because you gotta, you gotta be there for a little bit longer so they have a more opportunity to bite you and you gotta pull that out of the ground. Okay, so in that scenario, here is um, method one into responding to that. Method one would be get a stick and get a water hose with some pressure on it with, that has water. You put the stick in the in the ant pile and you just start jabbing it around, right? And it's going to bother them. And, and don't let them climb up the stick and bite you, right? So you might need a couple sticks. And then once they start coming out, start hitting them with water and then start opening up the ant bed with, um, with a stick. Now this won't necessarily kill all of them like a bait will, right? But what it does is it, um, it kills some of them, but it absolutely irritates them. And especially if you're exposed where the eggs are and you're hitting the eggs, oh, that's gonna just drive them nuts. So what it does is it displaces them. So if you continue to do this, and it's a very organic, like non-invasive to the food that you're growing, in other words, you're not putting chemicals down, uh, if you continue to do this, they'll move out of those areas. And, they'll, and they're not dumb. I mean, they're an amazingly communicative uh, creature. Um, and they'll move back eventually if there isn't an issue, but you, know, you just keep at it, you keep at it. Um, probably not the best idea in the drylands if you need to save water, but at the same, same time, you're not gonna have a big ant issue in the drylands, it could be termites, which is a, a different issue, but same thing, termites create great, great, uh, great soil. So that'd be my first line of attack, and I've never had to do more than that. And if you do, there's the orange oils and the, the peppers and things that you can make oil out of uh, and that stuff, but yeah, that's 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 a good way that I've found really good success with it. That nobody talks about, it, which should. Uh, good question, Brenda. So this one's from Tom. I live in South Florida. Just paid four hundred for organic compost with cow manure for three yards. Please advise how to do it cheaper. Oh my goodness, four hundred dollars for three yards. Um, that's price gouging, buddy. Uh, I would I would be pretty irritated about that. So go back and look at the replay on this when I email it out to you here later today, hopefully. And if it won't be today, it'll be tomorrow. <clears throat> and look at the 18 day compost method. That's how you can create a cubic yard of compost in 18 days. And by the way, you don't have to just do one. You can do four of them. 
all of a sudden, now you have four cubic yards of compost. And that could set you up for a good time with just potatoes and sweet potatoes. You'd be good. Um, all right, Mary Anthe Berber, what about chicken manure? I'm not exactly sure which part that you're talking about for chicken manure, but chicken manure is great for composting and even some uh, bit with the worms. Um, it does get, it gets hotter than horse compost. So um, you don't want to do your entire bedding there. Um, you can also put it in your sheet mulching at the very bottom. But normally when you get chicken manure, it's with straw. So it's kind of already ready to compost right away. So chicken manure in your compost, absolutely. Uh, Kristen Ludwig, your question is, uh, we just had snow in Spokane, Washington on Monday. Yeah, how about that, right? Uh, global weirding happening. Uh, you get snow in places it doesn't snow very often. Uh, what temperature should the soil or air be to start planting? Again, um, you know, who knows if you're going to have another snow. The climate is changing. Uh, it, the, the debate is whether it's humans or not, but it doesn't matter. It's changing. So, you know, all these frost dates are going to change some. Um, so just go to Farmer's Almanac and look at the average date and then stagger your planting, like I had mentioned uh, earlier. Um, so just in case some do freeze and die, you got more that you're planting. Here's a, a question here. It says, um, how do you keep squirrels, rodents, rabbits, possums, etc., out of the garden? Um, you didn't put bunnies on there. I'm surprised. So here's one thing I've found in the suburbs. If you, in, in, in the rural area too, if there's not a lot of people growing gardens, because uh, bunnies usually are like, you know, the, the Peter Rabbit, right? It's like the predecessor they're going after your, your plants. What I've found in the suburbs is that there's such a a disconnect with people growing food that they're not doing it, that the rabbits have adapted. And, as, and along with the other uh, uh, rodents, other than squirrels, the, that they don't even know that it's food, right? So they've already adapted to the native weeds and forbs and grasses. And it's not until those start drying out that they'll try the other things that are the plants that you're growing. Now that's not the same case for everywhere, obviously. Uh, but that's just something to, to think about that you might not even have a big of an issue as you have. Squirrels are a definite issue. So all of those rodents, uh, you have two easy, easy um, fixes. Uh, one is the farm cat and the rat terrier, right? So those animals are fantastic for rodents, uh, help you out a whole bunch. Another one is to invite owls. Uh, this is a new one for me, actually, is to create, put up owl boxes now, the owls also might take your chickens. So, you know, there's some, there, that's a little bit more advanced. We'll talk about that later. But especially those night creatures and even creatures that go underground, like the moles and voles, the owls are an excellent hunter there. Um, and <clears throat> also you, all of those, except armadillo, don't eat armadillo because armadillo um, spread leprosy, uh, believe it or not. We believe that it was, we were testing through armadillos and somebody had leprosy gave it to the armadillos and now it's in the wild um, which is armadillos are exceptionally interesting creature just don't eat them but um, you know you also might want to have target practice and so there's some free meat for you but obviously your cats and your your rat terriers are going to just absolutely adore any kind of rodent that's in your garden and then the poultry netting uh, you use the same poultry netting as well, and one little zap, those guys are, don't want anything to do with your garden. Um, <clears throat> wow, we went, we have a lot of questions here. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get through all of these. Um, I may do a follow-up on this, just answering the questions. I, it, it went quite a, a lot of them. Okay, so one from Jim De Etienne. Um, Excuse me, Jim, if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, do we need to be concerned with measuring temperature? How do we know if pile is getting hot enough, when to add water, green browns, et cetera? He's talking about composting. There is a compost thermometer that you can purchase. It has a long, it's like a, it's like a turkey or a, like a soup thermometer. It has a long um, 
uh, metal piece and then you just pop that into the compost and it tells you. So you're looking in the first four days or four to six days to get between 150 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's either 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. Correct me on that because um, uh, I'm sure I'm probably off. But also like you don't have to, like compost is gonna happen no matter what. It's gonna happen. Um, so if you open it up with the hay fork and you put your hand in there and it's kind of hot to touch, you're in the right area, right? You're in the right area. You can get too hot, but it's typically not the case. All right, good question. Here's a question from Rebecca Stewart. Can you talk about pot gardening if you have time? We live in a townhouse, so there's not a garden space available. What I should do is I should do uh, a quick class just on my vertical garden tower. It's not like the garden towers that you buy at the stores, which are $500 to get in the door. This is something that you can do with organic soil-based materials and not a hydroponic setup, um, which plants know how to grow in the soil and they're learning how to grow in the water, um, which is a unique thing. But <clears throat> yeah, if all you have is a patio or a limited amount of space, use the pots. Um, and then around your area, still plant a lot of flowers that are native to the region so you're attracting the wasps and the ladybugs and all the things that could be doing. Because now um, you either are gonna have a very sterile of pests, which is good, or it's gonna be a buffet line for pests. It's gonna like be one or the other. And so you still need some ecosystem around there, which you can kind of do on the periphery of your patio. Uh, that will probably need another uh, lesson. And I might just do a class just on urban small space patio stuff. I mean, wouldn't you like to be able to grow 96 plants in basically a uh, four by eight foot space, right? That would be amazing, right? And I can show you how to do that. Um, oh, there's a rabbit question there. Um, answered that a little earlier. How many eight by four beds do I need per person? Now, that's a really good question. Now, <clears throat> and it has a very terrible answer. Um, so, uh, I answer it two ways for not a lot of work. And if you have the land of two and a half acres at two and a half acres, you can pretty much the statistics show like 90 to hundred percent of your food needs can all come from two and a half acres of land. So your question is like, how many beds do I need per person? And that gives you some things to think about what I just said, but also here's a better way to think about it, right? Because each potato plant that you put in is sweet potatoes, you need to be three to 10 potatoes or sweet potatoes. How long are those gonna last you? Right? How much corn do you eat? So it's better to do an audit of what you're eating now. And if there are true scarcity of times then change your eating habits. And um, I would put in as many as you can, as many garden beds as you can. That's what I would do. Um, even if there's not a pandemic, you know, things are like I mentioned in the beginning, the, the idea behind, and, and look, there's people growing on an eighth or a tenth of an acre that are like amazingly doing a job, right? And so there's obviously that, but they're putting in lots of work as well. Um, but, you know, things are going to change. People are going to be more focused on this. Um, so uh, start with this and then learn more permaculture and the very, and the, and the, the simple but sophisticated methods of design that make your work a lot less and make it enjoyable. All right, here's a uh, question from uh, <clears throat> Diane Solicus. How can you tell from a package of seeds that they are hybrid? For example, I have a packet of sweet corn from Fairy Morse that doesn't have any info on it from Home Depot. Okay, so I, I don't know. It could be, it's probably hybrid. They sell a lot of the hybrid corn. So what you can do is it has a variety of uh, I don't know what Fairy Morse is, if that's a seed company or, or not, but look at the variety. It'll almost always have a variety name and then you can research that variety name on the internet and you can find out if it's a hybrid or open pollinated uh, seed. Here is a question from Moses Makachia. Hello, Nicholas. Hello, Moses. Praise the Lord. It's just when I'm starting to vermicomposting. Do you have a PDF copy that can study further? 
Good question. I don't have a PDF copy uh, that you can study further. And I tell you what, if you would like to be somebody who helps put one together so we can distribute it, um, reach out to me. I definitely can use some help. Tom, you said sweet potatoes rock. They sure do. Here's a question from Lena uh, Dion. Hi, Lena. Are there any gluten-free grains that are easy to grow that you would suggest as alternative to wheat? I know there are a number out there like amaranth, oat, but do you know about growing them and what would be easy to grow? So there's a lot, uh, well, I wouldn't say a lot. So yes, oats, uh, amaranth, rye, barley, um, and, I'm, and I'm missing a few, but yeah, there's there's a number of grains. If you just go to our school of permaculture, actually, we just had to reboot that site, so I don't know if it's there right now, but uh, it was the other day. But it but it will be here in the, uh, uh, when I send an email out. Uh, also, if you're not part of our school of permaculture face research group, go to Facebook right now and look up school of permaculture research group. That one is that's where it's a labor of love for me. I'm, I'm an educator, so I'm consistently studying and learning all the time and experimenting. So in all of those things, I'm documenting a quick blurb. It's like a small blog, basically, of that information. It's very useful. It's, a, it's very uh, popular um, amongst the people who want to go in depth. And in that group, um, I did a post on small grains and um, what a family typically needs and and the range is there, right? And there's a number of different different small grains that are there. So that's one thing that you can look at. I just got some celosia or celosia given to me from Brim Seed, it's a, which I'm looking forward to, to trying out. Uh, another question, will I be posting this recording? So can we get a list of suppliers that you recommend? So yes, I will be emailing everybody who registered this uh, recording and um, again, if somebody would like to help go through this and give me that list of suppliers that I recommended, I would be very grateful. Um, you know, we're a small operation here and we would definitely uh, like and utilize the help. Oh, here's a great question from Shannon Linzag. When do I plant the flowers? The same times as food plants? All right, so this is an interesting answer. If we weren't in a pandemic, you'd actually start with the flowering plants, right? You'd start with the native wildflowers. That's where you would actually start, get the ecosystem up beforehand. You can't do that now. So you just do them at the same time. Some of those plants are gonna be perennial and they might not even start to grow up for two years, right? They'll put a rosette the first year, go dormant and then come back out with a plant the next year. So as soon as you can is the answer on that. Um, and if we weren't in a pandemic, you plant them first, get the ecosystem up first. <clears throat> I'm going to skip down to kind of the, the later ones here and I can download this Q&A and I can go over um, these Q&As like you know maybe I'll have like a, a Q&A session just just a little bit at a time or, or we'll put it on our YouTube channel by the way go subscribe and click the bell to our YouTube channel it's just school of permaculture um, I've been putting out videos for a while, um, but it's a small channel, and uh, that's that's perfect. I'll take some of these questions and I'll answer them on the YouTube channel. That will be the easiest thing to do, rather than trying to do a webinar around it. But the classes we can do a webinar. Um, let's see. I'm actually going to do one final question here and then I'm going to call it a day uh, we're coming up on uh, we started at 9 30 oh wow we're two and a half hours so here's one from Sydney uh, Benjamin so curious about creating swells and burns to water the garden from our house rainwater runoff is this topic in the permaculture class absolutely it is so I can answer it quickly now don't worry about it whatsoever use the water even if you have roofing shingles, which has uh, VOCs in the, in the asphalt and whatnot. Absolutely, you can use it. So 
Uh, obviously not talking about swells and berms in this class, but you can use uh, rainwater is like plants love it. Plants love it. All righty. Oh, <clears throat> what a fantastic time. Are you all ready for the next one? Are you, let me know in the comments. Are you ready to, for the next one, either next uh, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday? Let me know. And uh, thank you so much uh, for, for coming and look, share this information, share what you've learned with your family and your friends. Like, like we have, especially if you're here, like you care about people, I would imagine, not just yourself, but care about your family, your loved ones, provide and protect for them. You know, I'm a God-fearing man. I love the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And look, my job is to love people, right? That's what I was called to do. And this is my expression of it in, in other ways as well. If you're also local to me and you can't get food, let me know. I have a network of people that would die uh, to help you out. Well, die is a strong word. They would love to help you out. How about that? So uh, <clears throat> thank you. And I look forward to the next one. I put a blessing on you in the name of Jesus. You guys take care and I will see you later. Bye-bye.